Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Some very strange things are about to happen, wherein the basics of normal living are drastically altered, and two people become lost in... Well, you'll hear. It'll all come out as we go along. Norma and Hal, he's Harold Glenford III, have inherited an ancient brownstone on New York's East 58th Street. Hal hasn't seen the house or the uncle who left it to him since he was a little boy. He doesn't know what to expect any more than Norma does, as they inspect the old house now for the first time since it became their own. Yuck, you need a machete to get through these cobwebs. Well, nobody's lived here in 10 or 15 years, you said, but it's going to be beautiful. A little belt tightening, maybe, but we can make it. I <laughs> don't advise tightening your belt. No kidding, Norma, the baby's due in April. You're going to have to stop working pretty soon. It's not going to be easy on my salary alone. Oh, nobody said it was going to be easy. And there are the ghosts, of course. Cut it out. Well, now, according to Uncle George, that's the reason nobody's been living here. The ghosts drove Uncle George himself out. That's what he said. And he couldn't keep the place rented, so he just gave up. Okay. A house like this needs a ghost. <laughs> mystery drama, The Fatal Connection, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Field and Farrington, and stars Jennifer Harmon and Nick Pryor. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Many scientists and philosophers see time as a road along which we pass, or a river along which we drift, the future waiting for us just around the bend ahead, the past obscured but not obliterated by the turn we just made. The rest of us, ordinary mortals that we are, find the moment in which we are currently trapped just about all we can handle. 
Norma and Hal Glenford have moved into their old house on East 58th Street. The furniture from their former three-room apartment only half fills the first floor. The second floor and the attic-like third floor will have to wait. Except, Hal, we'll have to have a nursery. You know, a baby's bedroom. <laughs> you stand there, the living proof of it. And there's no place for it on the first floor, so we'll have to find a place on the second floor, right? Logical. Then our bedroom will have to be on the second floor, too, don't you see? I mean, we have to sleep on the same floor with the baby. Hey, you're right. I hadn't thought of it before. The back room on this floor makes a very small bedroom anyway. We could use it as a sort of, uh, well, I don't know, music room or study or whatever. You make us sound very prosperous. We will be. Lawyers are always rich when they get a little older. I like the sound of that, Norma. Doesn't make any sense, but I find the simplicity of it comforting. <laughs> so shall we go upstairs and see what there's for a bedroom and a nursery? Okay. I'll go first and clear away the cobwebs. Oh, we'll carpet the stairway. Later, of course. When we're rich. <laughs> now, that's an old bedroom, as I recall. One of the doors is a linen closet. There are five doors, so that leaves just three rooms. And one more than we need. Well, this would be all right for our bedroom. It's much nicer than the little room downstairs, don't you think? Okay. Bedroom here. That takes care of us. Now about Junior. Hey, this door's locked. Well, just stuck, probably. No, it's locked. Why would anybody lock an inside door? That's odd. Where did I put that bunch of keys the lawyer gave us? In your jacket pocket, dummy. You think maybe there's a treasure hidden in that room? Or ghosts. It's been locked for a while. It's all furnished. Son of a gun. Right out of the 19th century. It, it looks like what used to be an upstairs sitting room or something of the kind. Oh, Hal, just look at that secretary. It must be a hundred years old, and it, it looks just as solid as... Oh, my gosh, a telephone. One of those old wall phones. I, I've seen pictures of them. Shouldn't it have a crank? Oh, I'd like to furnish the whole house just like this. You know, everything to match the house itself. I wouldn't change a thing in here. Well, I could live without the cobwebs and the dust. Well, I'll speak to the upstairs maid about it. Good help is so hard to come by lately, my dear. Have you noticed? <laughs> oh, I have indeed. It's the times, I'm afraid. <laughs> Everything seems to be going to pot. Well, darling, would you believe it? The butcher today wanted 18 cents a pound for steak. Just plain old beef steak. 18 cents a pound. Well, we might as well eat at Delmonico's if it costs that kind of money to cook at home. <laughs> oh, let's, shall we? This evening? Well... Why not? I'll order a hack. <laughs> Excuse me, my dear. Operator, I'd like a handsome cab sent to 621 East 58th Street at once. At once, understand? We'll be going to Delmonico's. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back downstairs where the 20th century is and see if there are any hot dogs in the refrigerator. <laughs> Actually, though, I, I guess 18 cents was hard to come by in those days, as $2 is today. Ah, uh, not for old Grandpa Glenford, it wasn't. Great Grandpa, that would be. He was filthy rich. Was he the one who built this house? No, I don't know that he built it. He was the first Glenford to own it. Whatever happened to all that money? Gave it away. Gave it away? That's what my father told me. Maybe it was just a figure of speech. You know what we ought to have? We ought to have a bottle of champagne to break over the bow of the house or the stern or whatever they break it, if houses had them. Well, now, if you look in the refrigerator, just to the right of the meat drawer, you'll find a quart of excellent domestic champagne cooling. To be taken internally, though, not broken over anything. Oh, what a doll you are. Shall we have it now? Well, I thought after dinner, but if you'd rather... What was that? Well, it sounded like somebody at the door. Well, what's the matter with the doorbell? Oh, honey, I don't know. Maybe it's broken. Maybe somebody likes the knocker better. I'll see who it is. Yes? What can I do for you? Your handsome cab, sir? For Delmonico's, I believe? It was 
was a joke of some kind, Norma. Who played it if it was a joke? I mean, who knew you made that nutty pretend phone call upstairs? I don't see how it could be a joke. Well, then, a coincidence. There are handsome cabs still operating over at Central Park. Oh, sure. And one of them just happened to drive all the way across town. And as long as it was in the neighborhood, the driver just thought he'd knock at our door and tell us our cab was here to take us to Delmonico's. Oh, come on, Hal. Well, okay. You, you explain it. I can't. That's what's bothering me. Well, you you don't think... Now, you, you surely don't think... No. No, of course I don't. What did the driver say when you sent him away? Well, something about it was a funny mistake for the office to make if I didn't order a hansom. He, he was grumpy about losing a fare. Did he look like a real hansom cab driver? I mean, did he, did he look like somebody you've seen driving a hansom around the park today? Or, or was he, well, you know, dressed like the real old-timey ones? I didn't really notice. Look, now, why don't we just forget him? Why don't we just have dinner and see what's on TV and drink our champagne and go to bed? I've got to go to work in the morning, even if I do live in a mansion. <laughs> Especially since I do. Here's to great-grandfather Glenford. Look, take it easy with that stuff, will you? The bottle's half gone already. You're a novice at this, remember? And here's to handsome cab drivers everywhere. <laughs> hey, you know what we ought to do? There isn't any more champagne, if that's what you mean. I only bought one bottle. No, no. What we ought to do is something about that phone upstairs. Yeah, like have it taken out. No, I, I want to order something. A, a new dress. Something like that. I mean, if they send over cabs when you order them, why not? You'd better let me finish this bottle. Bring it upstairs. Come on. Four years it's taken me to find out I married a lush. <laughs> there it is. Our fairy godmother compliments of the telephone company. <laughs> you want to go first? No, you go ahead. I'm just along for the ride. What shall I ask for? Well, look, don't fool around with one dress. Ask for a whole new wardrobe. As long as you're going to be a kook, you might as well be kooky in the grand manner. You're a genius. Hello. I want a whole new wardrobe. Oh, no, no. Two wardrobes. One for myself and one for my husband. Everything in the latest style and everything must fit perfectly. Oh, and have everything finished and delivered by the time I get home from work tomorrow afternoon. Ah, uh, that's, I guess, it for now. You want to order something, Hal? Well, sure. Why not? Here, give me that. Uh, hello. Uh, I want the house completely redecorated. Completely. Uh, restored, I should say, exactly as it was when the place was new. And I don't mean just when you get around to it. I want that finished by tomorrow afternoon also. By the end of the working day. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Let's finish this bubble water and get to bed. Hey, where do you bet you have a headache in the morning? <laughs> You'd have lost that bet. No headache. All I want is a cup of coffee, though. Me too. That's all we have time for anyway. Well, pick me up after work this afternoon. Sure. I may be a little late, though. That's okay. A secretary's work is never done. So, after I spend the better part of three weeks working on this brief, and it's brilliant, if I do say so myself, who do you think is going to take it into court? Mr. Fuller? Old J.C. himself. Who else? How was your day? Oh, you know. Once you've typed one letter, you've typed them all. You know something? We ought to walk home from my office every evening. Hold my briefcase while I unlock the door, will you? I wonder if they finished. Who finished what? The decorators, you know. You told them it had to be finished by the end of the working day. Oh. How? Now, this... This is... This is too much. I, I mean, what kind of a joke? It is, Hal. It's all been redecorated, restored. Just like you ordered. 
Oh, Hal. Hey, where's where's our new television set? Now, 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 now that is going too far. That that set cost color TV. That, that was a 21-inch screen. But how did they do it? Who did it? I mean, I can't figure. How? What? The refrigerator's gone. Look at this thing. What is it? It's an old ice box. It's it's full of ice. I don't think you can get ice like this anymore. There's, there's something... Th- this is all wrong, Norma. It's not a joke, is it, Hal? Nobody makes this kind of a joke. A coal range. An old coal range. My grandmother Scott had one of those out in his summer kitchen. Nobody used the things even then. The toaster, the, the blender, everything, Hal. It's all gone. That telephone. That damn telephone. It's real, isn't it? It really is real. You tell the telephone you want something and you get it. it it's like a, a... Like a genie in a bottle. You just order it and a... I think I'm scared. All right. All right. If it'll work one way, it ought to work the other two. In reverse. What are you going to do, Hal? Come on. I'm going up there and I'm going to tell that lousy telephone to put our own stuff back in this house and then leave us alone. That's what I'm going to do. Now, listen, you, whoever you are, I want you to stop... Number, please. Number, please. Oh, my God. How? Norma. Norma, let's get out of this place. A telephone? Redecorate and completely restore a 19th century house? And all in the course of an eight-hour day? It seems impossible, doesn't it? And yet there it is. And somebody did it. Or something. We'll look into it further when I return shortly with Act Two. Time. One of the many things we still don't understand about our universe. Now here, in an old house on New York's east side, Hal and Norma Glenford have found an antiquated telephone that seems to constitute some kind of flaw in what we consider the natural passage of time. At least in the incredibly short objective space of eight hours, the house has somehow become its original 19th century self. The past, if Hal and Norma can believe what they see and hear, has been trapped within its walls. The eeriness of it has sent the two of them frightened out onto 58th Street. It's so quiet out here. And so dark. I don't remember it being this dark before. Well, we haven't been around this neighborhood much at night. I guess east of First Avenue, the city just doesn't waste money on bright lights. Let's walk up that way, Hal. Uh, I just... Right now, I don't want to go back into the house. Okay. Up toward 3rd Avenue or Lex? You know, I don't think I ever heard New York this quiet before. East side, west side, day or night. It's, 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 it's like a tomb. Hal? Hal, do you hear it? I don't hear anything. Just... Now, do you hear it? Well, yeah, I hear something like a... It's like a... It sounds to me like an L train. A few blocks away, like the 3rd Avenue L. Which was torn down. When? 15 years ago. Well, listen to it. Hey, this I've got to see. But how, if it's the old 3rd Avenue L, then that means that everything... Oh, no, listen, we don't know what it means. Some nostalgia freak with a recording, probably. Something like that. Come on, let's go see. Now, if that isn't an L stopping, I've never heard an L stopping. Well, you haven't in a long time. But I've heard plenty of them when I was a kid. Wait a minute, Norma. What do you hear now? A horse. Don't tell me that's not a horse. That sure sounds like one. Mounted cop, most likely, or or maybe that same nostalgia buff. If 
that's a recording, then it's some recording. I've never heard a record. Now, that... wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. That horse is no recording. It's, it's either a mounted policeman or... There's your nostalgia, Buff. All four hoofs. Well, some companies must still use horses. You, you, know, you know, late at night. And... It's not that late. Anyway, look what's in the wagon. I see them. Those big milk cans. They used to... Well, look, I don't know. Maybe they still use them. I'm scared. Well, it's spooky. I admit that. So still and no traffic except that, that, that horse and wagon... Well, look, Norma, there's got to be a logical explanation. I mean, if there's not, what's happened? Have, have we lost our minds? Oh, no. Well, no, 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 Norma, don't get upset. No, Hal, that's not what I mean. Look up there. Up where? At the light. The street light on the corner. It's... It looks like a... It's a gas light. That's what it is. I think maybe we ought to get back to the house and, and, uh, and see if, if we can't get organized. It's back there, too. Helen. Okay, but if everything, if everything's gone back to the 19th century or something, let's at least go back and face it in our own home. If we still have a home. The key seems to turn easier. if there's somebody in there. I mean, we didn't live here, and... Oh, what year do you think it is, Hal? It's... Oh, Lord, I'm so mixed up. How can it be anything but 1974? That's what it is. Or was, or will be. Now, we've got to stop this foolishness. The first thing we need is some dinner. Maybe with some good, solid food inside us, we can take a more reasonable view of this mess. I don't know how to cook on a coal range. I don't even know how to make it burn, do you? Well, we were lucky there was some stuff in the icebox already cooked. I... I wonder who cooked it. Maybe my grandmother. What do you suppose happened to them? Your great-grandmother and grandfather. Are they supposed to be living here? Are they going to come walking in and... Listen, what's that? It's that phone upstairs, Hal. You mean the one that... Oh, Lord. Let it ring, Hal. Just let it ring. I can't. If it's somebody from whatever year this is, I've got to talk to him, Norma. I've got to. All right, but I'm going with you. They put carpet on the stairway. Or had it on the stairway, whichever. Hurry up, will you? I don't want whoever it is to hang up before we get there. It's actually a new house now, isn't it? You don't see the signs of age anymore. It doesn't look like a thousand coats of paint on everything. Hello? This is Bill, Harold. Where have you been all day? Well, I... I practically camped outside your office all afternoon, and you never did show up. Uh, uh, uh who, who did you say this is? Uh, are you all right, Harold? It's Bill, Bill Voigt, your partner. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I, uh, I, I was wool gathering. I guess you were. Listen, I've got to talk to you bright and early tomorrow morning. You're in a jam, Harold. A jam? Well, ca ca can't you tell me about it now? You'd better get in here tomorrow for your own good. It's nothing to do with me, but for your own good. Oh, well, if, uh, if it's that important... It is. It's to you, Harold, not to me. To you. All right. Th thanks for calling, Bill. What was that about a jam? He didn't say. But you want to know something weird? He thought he was talking to my great-grandfather. That man called me Harold, and that was his name. I, I, I can't remember anybody ever calling me Harold my whole life. He thought he was talking to my great-grandfather. I can't see. How did they read by these silly gaslights anyway? Well, there's an oil lamp right there on the desk. I think they used oil lamps to read by at night. The gas fixtures are all up on the wall. Well, do you know how to light one of these things amid the lamps? Well, just take the chimney off, or the glass thing. Then you hold a match to the wick like a candle. Because if this is my great-grandfather's desk, I mean, the way he left it only yesterday, I, I want to know what's in it. Is, is this what you mean by the wick? Yes. Do you think we'll ever get back, Hal? 
I don't know if I could stand it stuck here forever. There's no way of knowing, Norma. Everything's written in longhand. This looks like a deed of some kind. Most likely for the house. No. My gosh. What? This is a deed to an office building on Fifth Avenue. Way downtown, but that's where the action was in those days. These days. Your great-grandfather owned an office building? I told you, he was loaded. There goes that lousy telephone again. Don't answer it, Hal. Look, you can come with me. It's no good just letting it ring. It's got to be somebody important. There weren't many phones in those days. These days. Damn it. Only rich people could afford telephones. It'll just mix things up all the more, though, answering it. Look, it's our only contact the way things are. I wish. I wish. Oh, it's no good wishing. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mr. Glenford? Uh, yes? Uh, this is... Maud Spencer, Mr. Glenford. Is Norma in? Just... Just just a minute, I'll see. Norma, do you know a Maud Spencer? I don't know anybody here. She asked for Norma. Norma. Maybe it's a link of some kind. You'd better talk to her. Oh, Hal, I don't want to talk on that thing. Look, this could be the breakthrough. Here, talk to her. Uh, Hello? Norma, my dear, we were all expecting you at Sarah Aldrich's tea this afternoon. I do hope you're not sick. Sarah who? Aldrich. Sarah Aldrich. Well, you were invited, weren't you? Sarah said you were. Oh, well, yes, I I, I guess I was. I I, I mean, yes, of course I was. Well, I've been having these uh, spells, you know, headaches and that kind of thing. Oh, dear. No trouble about... Your delicate condition, I hope. Well, it it's related, I guess. Nothing to be concerned about. I'm just supposed to get a lot of rest, you know, stay at home and take it easy. Oh, dear. Is there anything I can do? I'll come and see you tomorrow afternoon. No, no, don't do that. What? I mean, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean it the way it sounded. All, all I meant was I... I'm perfectly all right. I I really don't need a fuss made over me or anything like that. It just isn't necessary. That's all I meant. Well, I'm sure I have no wish to intrude where I'm not necessary. I I wish you wouldn't. Hello? Hello? She hung up. It wasn't anyone you know? No. I, I was supposed to have gone to Sarah... Somebody's tea this afternoon and didn't show up. Well, it, it it could have been the breakthrough. One thing. Whoever was supposed to have answered this phone is called Norma. And she's pregnant. I'll tell you this. My great-grandfather was not a very popular man. How do you mean? Well, if he had any friends, they sure didn't write to him. These letters are all from people who hated his guts. Claim he stole them blind. Stole? Do you think it's true? I'm beginning to believe that old Harold Glenford Esquire was mixed up in some pretty shady enterprises. What kind of shady? Kickbacks, near extortion, character assassination, embezzlement, or something very like it. If a third of these letters are right, you name it, and old great-granddaddy Glenford was into it. Oh, that's shocking. Listen, you want to hear one? I'm not sure I do. Uh, Glenford... This guy signs himself James Blakely. Glenford, you are unfit to breathe God's pure air. The ways of God are beyond understanding, but justice is inevitable either in this world, which you be foul, or in the next, where never fear the punishment you deserve has been prepared for you. To hasten you into that world would be an act of the highest nobility. If I do not do the deed myself... Rest assured that another will in good time. Wow. A sample. Only a sample. How? Well, well, what is it? Look at this. It's a... This... This is a picture of you and me. That sure is what it looks like. But in those clothes? Well, where did you get this? In this desk drawer. Look on the back. Mr. and Mrs. Harold W. Glenford, on the occasion of their wedding, 
June 18, 1894. And look at those signatures. Except for a couple of curlicues, they're yours and mine. I, I can't help it, Hal. I'm scared. I don't see how it's possible, but it must be. I have somehow become my own great-grandfather. Not only that, but you're... You're my great-grandmother, and that child you're carrying, due to be born next April, is my grandfather. Paradoxical? Well, yes, of course. You presuppose paradox the moment you start moving about in time. How do you know you aren't your own great-grandfather or grandmother? If tomorrow you found an old telephone in your attic, <laughs> well, how do you know? I'll return shortly with Act Three. If I had my life to live over, that's not an uncommon expression. We've all heard it. But have you ever heard anyone say, if I had my great-grandfather's life to live over? That's exactly what has happened to Hal Glenford, if his conclusions are correct. He has not only gone back in time to his great-grandfather's day, but he has also taken on his great-grandfather's identity and... The wife he loves is now, as he must believe, his own great-grandmother. A situation of many complexities. Hal has broken open the strong box he found in old Harold Glenford's desk and has gone quickly through its contents. Well, there's one comfort. If we actually are my great-grandfather and grandmother, we're very rich people. What difference does that make? A lot. If we're stuck in this time. I want out, rich or not. Well, honey, so do I, of course. But there are securities and deeds in this strong box representing well over one million dollars in assets. And a million dollars was really worth something in 1897. Is that when it is now? Mid-November of 1897, according to the dates on those letters I read. How can't you do something about it? What? Invent a time machine? I Look... I don't know. Maybe it'll just happen. Like the other time, only in reverse. Norma, I'm sorry. That's the best I have to offer. Meantime, I think we ought to get some sleep. Sleep? In the middle of a thing like this, sleep? Try to, anyway. I wish we had that bottle of champagne we drank last night. Oh, Lord. It wasn't last night. The grapes that went into that champagne haven't even been planted yet. <laughs> Hello there. I, uh, I'm i sorry. I, I didn't realize you had someone in your office with you. Never mind. I was just leaving. <clears throat> Sit down, Harold. You were uh, wise to shave off your beard. My... Uh, oh, yes. Well, my uh, my wife never really liked it, and I, I thought... Well, it served you well. Blakely didn't recognize you. Was that James Blakely? What are you talking about? You know perfectly well it was James Blakely. Uh, uh, no, I mean, I, I had a letter from him yesterday. I could have... Uh, you, you, do you know I could have him in court for some of the things he said? <laughs> yeah, that's rather funny, you know. You you having James Blakely in court instead of the other way around? That's really very funny. I I don't think I, I know what you mean. Well, that's neither here nor there. I, uh, I, I want to dissolve our partnership, Harold, uh, as of this moment. Oh? Do you mind telling me why? Do you really think that's necessary? I wish you'd tell me... Oh, all right. All right. I've had my fill of being a thief's associate. Now, wait. Just oh, I know. I, I, t I took my share in the beginning. You're not the only fool in the room, but I'm through with it now. And thank God I had no part in the Blakely thing. All right. Uh, uh, I was checking things over last night, I, thinking things over. Some of my business tactics have been, uh, all right, shameful. I, I admit that, but... But I decided last night to change things. I mean, no shady dealings of any kind from now on. I see. Change things. And make restitution? Well, where, where it's reasonable, where, where it's possible. Without costing you money, you mean. I don't believe you, Harold. Not for a minute, I don't. 
How are you going to make restitution to Jim Blakely? I don't... Would you mind refreshing my memory on the Blakely thing? Oh, now, really, No, I've been lately... Lately, I've been reassessing. I've been reevaluating, and, and, and there are just so many details. I'd, I'd just like to hear the Blakely affair clearly stated. Objectively, you know. Oh, nonsense. Well, all right, if you want to hear it all over again, if you, if you really want to wallow in that miserable can of worms a second time... Please. Bill, it would help me. Well, Blakely came to you in the first place looking for a handout. On the tape, granted. I'm sure you haven't forgotten that. Uh, uh, no. You were still under 30 at the time, but you were already under under my guidance, damn it. That's what I hate. You were already a power in the construction industry. Blakely was sure you gave kickbacks, and he wanted one. Then he was as much to blame as I if he came to me. At the time, you managed it so that you had his signature on a dozen damaging documents. And you, you never signed so much as a letter to him. You remember that. Well, you've always worked that way, and you gave him a low bid on that job, and good value, too. The State Parks Commission building, wasn't it? I, I, I don't remember. And Blakely got a promotion because of it, and another, and another, until he was made State Highways and Buildings Commissioner. It wasn't until then that you started blackmailing him. Blackmail? Well, it's, it's not an uncommon practice to... Ah, and you bled him white. No more kickbacks, but every contract out of Blakely's office has gone to you for... What's it been, two years now? Well, if I put him where he is in the first place... They've it's... caught him, Harold. He's going before a grand jury next week, and they'll indict. He's finished. There isn't a shred of evidence against you except his word, which, of course, isn't worth a tinker's damn now. You never signed a thing, did you? A man who signs damning documents is nothing more than a... A fool, like Blakely. Well, does that refresh your memory? It... It puts things in perspective. Well, as I've told you, I'm very happy that I had anything to do with the Blakely business. Right now, he's thinking about killing you. No, seriously. That was just what he was telling me. Oh, God. What's the matter? Nothing. I I, I, I I just remembered something. I'll have to leave now. There's something I must do. But uh, before you go, about dissolving the partnership, I don't know how you feel about it, but Anything I... you say. Anything you say. It doesn't matter. We'll do it any way you like. It isn't important now. Hal? Oh, Hal, I'm so glad you're home. Yes, listen, we have to get out of here. It's so awful, Hal, being in a place you're so terrified of and being even more terrified of leaving it. I've never in my life... Norma, before... Norma, we have got to get out of here. Out of here? Where to? I mean, all together out of this time. We've got to get back to the 20th century. Hal, something's happened, hasn't it? No. Yes. Norma, there's no time now. Let's try the telephone again. I want to know. Tell me, Hal. Tell me. Listen, I want you to get off the line. Do you understand? I want you to just unplug yourself or whatever it is you do and just get off the line. Just for a minute or two. Will you do that, please? Number, please. Oh, for God's sake, shut up. If you can't get off the line altogether, at least shut up. Don't talk. All right. Listen, you, whoever you are, we have had enough of this nonsense. We want to go back to the 20th century and we want to go back now. You're the one who got us into this mess. Now get us out of it. Do you hear me? Number, please. Damn. Oh, what are you doing? Pulling the wires out of the wall. Can't you see? I'm trying to get this lousy telephone back the way it was when we first moved in here. All right. Can you hear me? You in there in your damn stupid telephone? I want you to put us back. Do you hear me? We didn't ask to be brought here. We're not responsible for anything that happened before we got here. We want to go back. You can't punish me for something my great-grandfather did. Do you hear me? All right, don't answer. You don't have to answer. Just do it. I don't know what else I can do. How the phone isn't hooked up. You pulled the wires out of the wall. It wasn't hooked up before when all this started. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it'll get us out of here before... Before what, Hal? Okay. Come on downstairs. I guess you'll have to know. 
And he's threatening to kill me. Blakely is. That's what my great-grandfather's esteemed partner told me this morning. Well, then what are we sitting here for? We have to get out of this house. It won't do any good, Norma. It will. There must be a thousand places to hide. You're you're just a, a, a sitting duck here. No, there's no hiding place but the 20th century. Back where we're really Hal and Norma Glenford. There's, there's, there's no hiding place at all in this century. I just don't know what you're talking about. The thing is, I remember now. I remembered while I was sitting there in Voight's office. Remember what? I remembered hearing my grandfather. Was he my grandfather or my son? I, I, I remember when I was just a little boy hearing my grandfather telling my father about it. About what, Hal? My great-grandfather was shot to death by a business associate. By a man he'd cheated, ruined. That's what my grandfather told my father. All right, all right. That was your great-grandfather. But it's already happened. To whichever one of us was here, it's already happened. It can't be changed. I don't believe any of that. I, I don't. I want you to do something. I've done all I can do. It's up to that... 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 Telephone upstairs. Maybe if we just sit here and and think 20th century, it'll work. Close our eyes and and just know we're in the 20th century. Listen for auto horns. Think about the Pan Am building. Try to decide what we'll watch on TV later. Breathe the polluted air. Mightn't it work, Hal? It couldn't hurt. Close your eyes. That'll be Blakely. Don't answer it. Do you think I'm crazy? Now listen to me. If if he's got a gun, he can get at us through the front window. I want you to head for the coat closet as fast as you can and get in there and stay in there until I tell you to come out. Have you got that? Yes. Norma, get in the closet. No. Not as long as you... Get down. Norma, get down on the... Don't move, Norma. He may still be out there. How you... You're bleeding. I am. I don't feel anything. But I can't seem to... All over your shirt. I'm going to call an ambulance. Now, don't move. I'll be right back. Don't move. I can't... Can't call an ambulance. I... I pull the wires out. Remember? I'll... I'll go out, Hal. There must be a cop or something. I'll go, Norma. Please, it it wouldn't do any good. It's already happened. But I can't just... I might not be here when you get back. Oh, uh... Al. I want to tell you something important. All right. The the kid, next April... I'll I'll name him Harold and and I'll call him Hal. No. (laughs) Anything but that. Oh. Anyway, his his name was Edward, my grandfather. How don't you think I ought? No, no. Tell tell Edward. Tell him when he's old enough. Understand? <laughs> tell him get rid of the money, all of it. Dirty, filthy, dirty. Justice must be served. That goes without saying. But how many times? It's unlikely, of course, that anyone listening to me at this moment will ever find himself unexpectedly living in the 19th century. But just in case... How much do you really know about your great-grandfather? I'll be with you again in a few minutes. Young Edward Glenford, Norma's baby, was born in April 1898 and lived a long and, in some respects, fruitful life. He never made much money, but he gave away several millions of dollars, according to the instructions left by his father. 
But was it his father or his grandson who gave him those instructions? I leave you to puzzle it out for yourself. Our cast included Jennifer Harmon, Nick Pryor, Robert Maxwell, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Hugh, what are we doing? What is it? It's all over now. It's gone. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Oh, no. That poor, poor Sandy. Just look at him. Ripped to pieces. As if he'd run into the blades of a, 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 of a threshing machine. But what did it? The damned thing. The what? That's what I call it. The damned thing. First, it did away with my chickens, and then the pigs and the cattle. And now poor Sandy slashed to pieces. And that's not the end. Only the good Lord knows what the damn thing will destroy next. Or who? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is... Cloak and Dagger. Warfare, espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's adventure, The Cutchin Story, tells of an agent, an American agent, dropped behind Japanese lines in Burma. A story suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. The sky hangs low over Burma. In 1944, it was more than just a smoke and dust haze that blankets it in the dry season. It was the tension in the air that weighed the clouds down so that they almost seemed to be pressing against the wings of our plane. You ought to reach your objective in a few minutes, Mike. Good. I'll tell you when to hit the cell. You got everything? Yep. Radio, supplies, I'm all set. Boy, that's thick jungle down there. Thick with Japs. That's what I mean. I looked down on the towering jungle-covered mountains of North Burma. I thought of the small band of Kutchin natives who were waiting to meet me. I thought about how pitifully outnumbered they were behind the enemy lines. And how they hated the Japs. And then, all of a sudden... Ah! I didn't have time to think anymore. Lousy Jap fighter. What cloud did he crawl out of? It's too late to run. We're in for it. Sorry, you're going to be late for your appointment. Brother, what I could do with a tail gunner now. Hold on to your stomach, Mike. I'm gonna see if I can loop and get behind him. Ah, oh, he's still in a tail. Yeah, he looped right behind me. He hit a 
attention. Come quiet, lousy. Nice work, you got him. How bad are we hit? We won't make it. We're gonna try to belly laugh. Can we jump? Too low for that. Hold on. Watch those trees. I can't pull her up, Mike. I can't. I can't. I was thrown from the plane when we crashed. I got off with nothing more than a leg that was bleeding pretty bad. When I crawled back to the wreck, I found the pilot. He wasn't so lucky. I started to run. I didn't know where I was going, but I started to run anyway, through the bamboo thickets. My leg was throbbing with pain, and I tripped. The pistol dropped out of my holster and disappeared into the high grass. I didn't have time to look for it. Somewhere to the north were the Cutchins. I had to get to them. This was headhunter country. In those days, Japs paid high prices for American scalps. After a while, my breath came out. I couldn't go any further. My imagination put Japs and headhunters behind every tree. I told myself I had to stop. I told myself I didn't have enough wind to take another step. But I changed my mind when behind me I heard a twig snap. There was someone following. A quiet, stealthy someone on padded cat's feet. I kept on running into the river. I didn't bother to look first for crocodiles. The numbness from my bad legs spread all over me. I could hardly swim. All I wanted to do was get away from that shadow behind me. When I reached the opposite shore, I clambered onto a sandbar. Safe. Safe. Then I looked back. I saw that tireless shadow emerge from the bushes and flit silently across the river on a fallen tree trunk. My lungs were ready to burst. I pulled myself up again and fell over some roots and waited. Waited for that shadow to catch up with me. I just lay there and waited. Okay. Okay, you win. Where do we go from here? We'll say something. We'll just stand there. I probably won't be able to understand you, but say something anyway. A half-naked warrior just stood there staring at me, saying nothing. I'd have given anything to have had my gun back again. And all of a sudden I did. He just reached down and handed it to me. Hey, I... I don't get it. What's that... What's that card you're holding? Follow this guide. He will lead you to safety. Well... Well, now you're talking. <laughs> sure, and you couldn't look more surprised, Captain, than if the tall grass parted and you came on a field of four-leaf clovers. <laughs> I feel that way, Father. <laughs> like you turned over a stone and there we were. Well, that's about it. I thought that native following me was a headhunter. I know they'd turn any American over to the Japs for a two-pound bag of salt. Ah, you're right there, unholy savages that they are. We saw your plane fall, and I sent Ying here after you with that message written on the card. He's the fastest runner in the Cochin village. I'm sorry he put such a scare into you. Oh, 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 oh forgive me, Captain Shea. Uh, did I pull the bandage too tightly then? No, no, it's okay. I don't mind it too much. When I think of what happened to the pilot, I was lucky. Ah, yes. It was a pity about the pilot. Ying, the scissors, if you don't mind. Thank you. There. Oh. No, almost done now. Then we'll go out and you'll meet the villagers. The women have prepared a special banquet for you. Oh, that's very nice of them. 
Have you been a missionary here in Burma long, Father? Oh, for almost 12 years now. I hardly remember any other life. These good natives have all become sons and daughters to me. <laughs> We've taught each other. I speak their language. They all speak English now. They do? As well as I. Almost. Then uh, I have a question, Father. Yes? How come Ying over there took ten years off my life, chased me through the jungle? Why didn't he say something? Well, Ying didn't speak to your Captain Shea because he wasn't able to. What? He was a prisoner of the Japanese some time ago. They cut out his tongue. Uh, that, uh, that other roll of bandage, please, Ying. Thank you. Colleen, put more wine in the bamboo cup for our guest, eh? Yes, I will be happy to. Here you are. What did you call her father? Colleen, to make it easier for me, I've renamed many of the villagers. That woman stirring the big kettle is Kathleen. And the other beside her, Bridget. <laughs> I get the general idea. <laughs> and your name is Shay. <laughs> Mike Shay. A good Irish name if I ever heard one. Well, uh, actually, Father, it's Michael Shikalnikov. Would you mind repeating that? Shikalnikov. It's Polish. I shorten it because everybody has trouble pronouncing it. Sometimes I have trouble myself spelling it. Yeah. I see. Well, no matter. No matter. Uh, uh, tell me more about your mission. Well, I was sent by the OSS to establish radio contact, Father, with the Northern Area Combat Command in Burma. Give them any information and help I can. That is, with your help, of course. Ah, yes. Well, you'll find us of great assistance. Immediately after the banquet, you can find a place to set up your radio. So, uh, how are you enjoying your meal? Mm. My wife never made anything that tasted like this. <laughs> Do you like it? Eat well. Let me fill your plate some more. Mm, thanks. Mm, it's very good. Uh, what is it? We make it special for you today. White bees we boil for hours. Uh, I, uh, guess I've had enough. <laughs> I don't feel right moving you out of your hut, Father. Ah, it's quite all right. I can easily find another basher. This is the best spot for your radio. I I'll even leave you the, the decorations on the walls to inspire you. <laughs> Ginger Rogers, huh? Yeah. That's your favorite pin-up? <laughs> well, she's a fair lass, all right. She brightens up the basher. Well, with your permission, then, I'll uh, stick a snapshot of my wife up with the rest of these pictures. Yeah, that does it. You know, when I think of my wife, I feel a little guilty. Why is that, my son? Oh, I don't know. Thought of her going blind, squeezing all the news from home into V-mail, worrying herself sick about me. And all the time, I never felt more free in my life. Yes, I know just what you mean. I love this life in the jungle, as well as the people, my people here. I don't think I could ever leave now, Shakul... Uh, Shakul... By the by, do you mind if I call you O'Shea? <laughs> no, no, not at all, Father O'Toole. Not at all. This jungle home was a far cry from the third floor walk-up in New York and the job behind the desk in the insurance office. The Cutchin warriors aren't imposing figures. They're short, squat, with long matted hair and teeth worn to a black stub by betel nut. They led a simple village life, eating rice, trapping wild pigs, the technique they also used in trapping wild Japs. But they were friendly, happy people, and life with them was pleasant. Until one afternoon when a report came in on the radio. North Area Combat Command to Agent Shakalnikov. Agent Shakalnikov of the OSS to North Area Combat Command. You're coming in clear, awaiting message. Come in. Over. 
capture of jungle town of Michina and its airstrip is vital to aid Allied advance in Burma. Battalions of American marauders will attempt capture. They will rely on your help to get them through the jungle. Over. Agent Shikolnikov to headquarters. Have a small band of Kutchins organized. We will do what we can. Awaiting further instructions. Over. Other native armies under OSS leadership have been alerted. Stand by. Stand by. This is imperative. Over and out. Well. What? Oh, Father O'Toole, I, I didn't see you standing there. You heard? I heard, O'Shea. This is a big push, all right. That airport at Michener could mean success or failure of the whole American campaign in Burma. We'll get our warriors ready. In the meantime, there's nothing we can do but wait for orders. That's always the worst part of it. Wait. (laughs) Quiet! Quiet, my children, quiet! Now, it is as I have told you. When the order comes from the Americans, we will advance upon the enemy. We leave now, Father. Catch enemy ourselves. No, 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 no. That's not the way we must work from now on. The American will be our leader. We will do as he says. We will follow Captain O'Shea. Combat Command to Agent Shekalnikov in Burma. A battalion of marauders on the way to Michina has been cut off from the main body of the column and lost in the jungle. Radio contact gone. Find them and supply reinforcements. Over. Agent Shekalnikov to headquarters. We'll do the best we can. Over and out. Well, we've waited two weeks for an assignment, but when it came, it was a beauty. Well, the problem, O'Shea, is locating that battalion. Now... It occurs to me... Yes, yes, Father. It occurs to me that if they're surrounded by the Japanese somewhere in the jungle, the Japanese themselves would know exactly where that spot is. Father, I don't get you. Well, there's a Japanese bivouac less than six miles from here. There are undoubtedly Japanese high command who have the information we're after. I've got you now, Father. But one of the scouts come with me to show me the way through the jungle. We'll sneak into that Jap camp and... Bring one of the officers back with us. Well, the two of you alone? Sure, sure. Too many of us and we're liable to get caught. Just a couple of us can make it. All right. Wait till the moon is halfway across the sky. Then go. And the Lord go with you. When the moon was halfway across the sky, the scout and I set out. Back through the jungle I'd come from. Only this time I was a shadow, too, slipping behind the bamboo thickets, cutting my way through the dense jungle foliage. We didn't talk much. Only what was necessary. Jap, camp, close, now. Good. Jap, camp, there, ahead, see through bushes. Yeah, I see. All those fires lit. Must be some kind of a powwow going on. Sentry there, where finger points. Yeah, yeah, I see him. We will surprise Sentry. Sneak in camp from there. I'm right behind you. No talk. Quiet, no talk. Noise, bring many chaps. Okay, through the bushes. Follow me. Watch for snakes. Is that all you're worried about? What about the tigers and wild boars, Komodo lizards? What? What snake? Snake. You move. We strike. What do we do? Can you get him with a stick? A rock? Gun best. Gun, they'll hear us. Gun best. Rock no good. Stick no good. If I miss, you die. Gun. Gun. Boom. I stood there like somebody who had been frozen dumb and stiff. My heart was pounding like a jungle tom-tom. If he killed the snake, the Japs were sure to come running. If he didn't... He raised his gun slow. Slow. The snake was swaying back and forth. Dead. 
snake. Much dead. He killed him all right, but we didn't have time to escape back into the foliage. After that, nothing's clear in my mind. Poor Japs all around us, yelling like crazy, and lots of guns going. And the Kutchin scout fell flat on his face, dead. Then somebody butted me from behind with a pistol. And the moon went out of the heavens. And the sky that hangs low over Burma came down and hit me in the face. Wake up, American. Wake up. What? Huh? What happened? Oh, oh my head. I am Colonel Haichi of Japanese High Command. I regret that we were forced to render you such stormy welcome. Colonel Haichi, eh? You speak English pretty well. Massachusetts Institute of Technology, class 37. DeWitt Clinton High School, the Bronx, class of 33. We will get along well, I think, if we make a little trade. What kind of a trade? Your life for little information. I see. The American marauders. I want to know their numbers, their positions, their objective. I don't know. If I did, I wouldn't tell you. God. Oh. That whip was simple. We have much more in store for you if you do not agree to be more agreeable to our simple requests. I give you 24 hours to think it over, American. The hut they threw me into was small and dark. There was a sentry posted at the entrance. What I remember most about those 24 hours was the heat. Wet, sticky heat that made my skin crawl and my lips dry. It was a cute trick of the MIT graduate class of 37 to let the water drip from a pipe right outside the barred window. After a while, it begins to get you when you're thirsty. You, get up. Get up. Huh? Can I see you now? Up, American. Up. Okay, up. okay, get your hands off me. What? What's that? Uh, stampede. Stampede. Elephants. Oh. Good work, Ying. Good work. That's one less Japanese to worry us. Father O'Toole, where'd you come from? What is this? No time for long explanations now, lad. Uh, they outnumbered us 50 to 1, and we needed heavy ammunition. Elephants were the heaviest we could find. Yeah, but how did you... Well, when you didn't come back, I sent a runner. We found the body of this guy. Come, we must leave now. Yeah, but the information I came to get. Oh, 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 that. We'll take it with us. Kutchin warriors in this village have a grudge against your people, Colonel Hayachi. Maybe you can tell us why. You cannot frighten me, American. You get no information from me. Shoes on the other foot now, huh? So it would seem. Ying. I'd like you to meet Ying, Colonel Aichi. Some months ago, he was a Japanese prisoner. His tongue was cut out. I'm going to turn you over to Ying. No! No! He can ask you questions his own way. Go on, take him, Ying. No, no, no! No, get him away from me! I will tell you what you want to know! I will tell you why we have surrounded lost battalion... I tell you where they are. That's more like it. Start talking. The warriors got ready to attack. And a great holiday spirit took over the village. But we must come. We always come, Moshe, when our warriors go ambush Japanese. But this is crazy. I can't have a lot of women and kids and old men tagging along. We go. We go. Old men carry flintlock, muzzle loader. Women, we do our job also. Now, wait a minute. When battle finish, women cook big party. Samba dear, monkey me. What, and serve it piping hot in the front lines? Nothing doing. I'm going to see Father O'Toole about this. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
You have your troubles, I have mine, O'Shea. But we can't let that whole tribe come along. This isn't kids' play. They'll come with you like them to or not, O'Shea. They always do. In the meanwhile, look at my predicament. Some son of Satan stole me false teeth. What am I to do without me teeth? Father O'Toole, please, we haven't much time. Aichi gave us a map. We know where the marauders and the Jap attackers are. But we won't do them any good just sitting here. I'm not just sitting here, O'Shea. I'm trying to find me teeth. The whole village went along, whether I liked it or not. And Father O'Toole came along, too. Without his teeth. The Kutchin warrior knew the back trails of the jungle as well as I knew 42nd Street. Ying seemed to be the leader, and he led us through little-known passes and long hidden underbrush, closer and closer to the spot where we knew the Japs had the American battalion cut off, helpless, just where they wanted them. No one made a sound, and Ying held up his hand. What is it, Ying? This junction of the two trails. He's not sure which one to take. That's it, Ying, isn't it? Well, why don't we split up? Half of us go one way and the no, other. No, no, no. There aren't enough of us. The Cutchins have their own methods. Why is Ying pointing at me? He's given you the honor of contributing a hair from your head. A what? A hair from your head. Here, let me have one. Ah, thank you. Here you are, Ying. Why is he throwing it on the ground? We'll go in the direction the hair points. It's not very scientific. No, but it always works. Ah, it points to the right. We'll go to the right. You're right, Father O'Toole, it did work. Here are the chaps. And there are the marauders dug into those foxholes. Yeah, they're surrounded, all right, poor lads. So wonder they held out this long. Our business then is to attack the enemy from the rear and give the battalion a chance to hit back. We can't attack them. There's too many of them. We'll have to ambush them. Yes, yes, true. I, if only I had me teeth, I could think better. Ying, some of you others, come here. Listen, our only chance is to draw them off from the left. There's a clearing there. It'll give the marauders a chance to get out of that encirclement. We chase chap soldier up here. We set trap for them. That's the idea. Panji! We make Panji! Panji? What's that? Hey, you want a trap, Set? What? You're about to witness the Cutchin secret weapon. What are they doing? They're whittling those bamboo poles to sharp points. Then they'll stick them at the slant beneath the underbrush on either side of the trail. When the enemy passes, our warriors will fire, and the Japanese will dive to the sides. I get it, and cut themselves to ribbons. Very effective. Very pretty. The natives worked quickly. The women helping them whittle the bamboo to razor points. When everything was ready, I took a few of our men to the left flank, and we fired. And they ran right into our trap. Very effective. Not so pretty. They committed mass harikari all along the trail. That's all there was to it. I never thought we'd get out of those foxholes alive, Captain Shikolnikov. Thanks for helping us chase the rest of the Japs off. I'm glad we could help, Major. The Cutchins will lead you the rest of the way through the jungle so you can rejoin the main body of your column. Can we leave now? Oh, no, Major. The women would be insulted. I'll drill in the battle. They were busy preparing the victory feast. <laughs> Pretty sure of themselves, weren't they? <laughs> Good wives. They have confidence in their husbands. <laughs> the feast is ready. Uh, they're even dressed for it. <laughs> Look at that. Flowers in their hair and everything. All dressed up. One of them is overdressed. Colleen, come here. Yes, father. Don't you yes, father me. What do you got around your neck? Well, <laughs> pretty necklace. I bow for the victory. My false teeth. <laughs> now, you find yourself another necklace and give them back to me. No. No, then I have nothing. This pretty... Oh, I said... Colleen, Colleen, listen to me. Here, uh, here's something prettier. My sharpshooter's medal. Sharpshooter? Mm-hmm. Every American soldier has one to give to the prettiest girl he meets. Would you like it? Hmm. So shiny. Ribbon pretty, too. Father O'Toole, you have back your teeth. 
<laughs> Captain Shekolnikov, you're worthy of the name of O'Shea. <laughs> The capture of the vital airstrip and the ultimate conquest of Michina was due to the combined efforts of the marauders who attacked it and the Kuchin warriors who helped them and harassed the enemy all along the way. And once more, the report of an OSS agent closes with the words, Mission accomplished. A further adventure in black warfare is next week's... Cloak and Dagger. Heard in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure were Raymond Edward Johnson, Carl Weber, Bill Quinn, Joe Julian, Everett Sloan, Inga Adams, Jackson Beck, and Jerry Jarrett. The script was written by Winifred Wolfe and Jack Gordon. Music was under the direction of John Gart. Today's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This has been a Lewis G. Cowan production in association with Alfred Hollander and was under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Robert Warren speaking. search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. The Creaking Door. The manufacturers of State Express 3.5's Filter King cigarettes take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. Good evening, friends of the Creaking Door. The Creaking Door is No good holding back. But don't look too closely. Otherwise, you'll see the dim outline of that horrible specter that appeared in your nightmares. Ready to go? Of course you are. The spirits moved you. <laughs> Get the taste. Three fives by State Express. Get the taste of international success. The taste that's uniquely three fives. Only when no expense is spared in its making can a cigarette taste so right, so smooth, so satisfying. Three fives. Get the taste. The taste that State Express created for you. The taste that has made Three Fives the king-size cigarette of international success. Get Three Fives. Get the taste. White Oaks is a gloomy estate somewhere along the jagged coastline. White Oaks has long passed its heyday. On the floor in a corner of the library, staring blindly at the ceiling is an old man, his cheek and neck riddled with bullets. A 
across the room is a young man, mortally wounded. Ten feet away from him is a safe. Against the safe door is a homemade chemical bomb with its fuse sizzling, like a giant firecracker about to explode. The door of the safe has blown open. The contents scatter around the young man lying nearby. Smoke circles around him and cash and securities drop at his feet. He tries to get out. But he can't. His hand creeps to a bundle of cash and drops helplessly over it. Miller? Yes. Come on, son. Don't die yet. Who are you? Police. How do you know my name? Went through your baggage. You've been masquerading as Tom Reed. Yes. <laughs> Fool that I was. Didn't get far. How do you feel? Like death. Well, where am I? In hospital. You take a lot of killing. Did I? You wouldn't be bursting with curiosity about me. Ready to talk, son? I am. If you'll listen. That's what I'm here for. Jim Miller's my name. As a kid, I went right out of the reformatory into jail. Number 106317 was my name for ten years. 106317. Every night before turning in, I swore that 106317 was how many it would cost society to square accounts with me. Society? Answering to the name of Tom Reed? It, it just happened to be Tom Reed. It could have been Dick Nobody or Harry Anybody. How did it begin? It was a day out of jail, hanging around the docks, wondering where I could catch the price of a drink. A big liner had just come in out of the fog, one of those pleasure liners. I watched the passengers come off, without a care in the world. Among them was Tom Reed, dressed to kill. My eyes kept wandering over to him, and the thought kept jabbing at me that there was a man I could be if I played my cards right. We were about the same age and build, except that Reed was a little pale around the gills. All Reed had on me was a bank car. The car rolled up, and Reed went to it. I went after him. What scheme I had in my mind, I'm not clear on anymore. It might have been the ring on his middle finger, or the pounds he flashed when he tipped the kid and brought the car. Or maybe I was just going to catch a meal. Anyhow, there I was, over the car. Staring at him, tongue tied. Yes. Is there something you want? Yes. Yeah. Driving north? Hitchhiking? Yeah. Oh, hop in. All right. Oh. <laughs> I'm Reed. My name's Jim Miller. How far are you going? Well, as far as I can. But no destination? No. How far are you going? About 200 miles. White Oaks. Ever heard of White Oaks? No. <laughs> it's the show place of the Cornish coast. And what's it now? <laughs> A mausoleum. I'm the last of the reeds of White Oaks. You bragging? I suppose there is something indecent about too much money. Have you got too much money? A hundred thousand in three days' time. Why in three days? My inheritance comes to you then. Well, how do you collect? Does a cashier pile the money up in front of you? <laughs> no, a blind uncle you haven't seen for years taps his cane along the floor towards a safe that's been in the family for generations and opens it. <laughs> and hands you a hundred thousand? Just like that? <laughs> Just like that. My father never trusted banks. I turned the figure over in my mind. A hundred thousand. One oh six three one seven. It was 6,317 shy of my number, but close enough to write off the debt owed me. I saw Reed looking queerly at me out of the corner of his eye. Tempted, Miller. I, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. Pose as me for three days, then go off with all that money. Blind Uncle Walter would never detect the masquerade. That's what you're telling yourself, aren't you? And uh, where are you all the time I'm posing? Easy. You've murdered me. You're putting ideas into my head? I'm reading your thoughts. You're a queer duck. 
and you're an open book, Miller. If I'd have any idea like that, Reed's openness put the kibosh on it. You can't lay hands on someone who talks on your level. I even got to like him. A little. We chewed up about a hundred miles. And I caught that funny look crossing Reed's face again. I watched the end clasp over his heart. Reed seemed to sag and the car began to circle wildly. I grabbed the wheel in the nick of time. We almost dropped off an incline. I pulled to the side and shut the motor. What's it, you read? It's my heart. How bad is it? The doctor gave it a year. I've been shortchanged by two weeks. Get me to a doctor. He sounded like he only had minutes. Uh, Get me to a doctor, Miller. I stalled. There was a little man counting off 100,000 in my mind, slowly, by ones. Reed's eyes were on me. They were dying eyes. But I caught a twinkle, as if he were amused over something. (laughs) Here's your chance, Miller. Just sit it out under the stars. Forget the doctor. What I like about you is your sense of humor. I'm taking you to a doctor. (laughs) Thanks, fool. But don't bother, it's... It's too late. Free. Bury me somewhere. That's Jim Miller. <laughs> You'll be Tom Reed for those three days. You're inviting me to? It's destiny, perhaps. Perhaps you didn't just happen to come up. <laughs> It was too late to play Boy Scout and race for the doctor. Reed was dead. I sat around a while thinking over what to do. But there was nothing to think over. My mind had been made up for me a long time before Reed happened along. I told myself that Reed's dying remark practically made me his heir. But I didn't have to tell myself anything. The little blind man he talked about was already counting 100,000 in my head. 100,000 pound notes. I found a lake about five miles up the side road. Not a house or a human anywhere. I swapped clothes with Reed, weighed his pockets with stones, then said goodbye and let him slip. I ran for the car and headed for White Oaks. Reed's wallet pushing against me as I drove. It was a down payment on the 100,000. I got to White Oaks. The storm raged. The house was high on a hill. It looked forbidding. Everything about it seemed to say, keep out. Making an entry was easy. Easy, did I say? Every ghost story I'd heard as a kid played with my spine. If the outside had given me the release, the interior put the icy frosting on it. There were shadows from kerosene lamps doing a jig on the walls. Not a soul in sight. Where was the blind uncle? Anybody home? I could hear an echo hanging in the air. And then I heard a tapping coming at me out of the shadows. Uncle Walter came towards me, feeling his way with a cane. An old guy with more wrinkles than face. His hand reached for me and I, I could feel my flesh crawling. Tom? Hello? Uncle Walter? Give me your hand, nephew. Of course. It's been so long since I felt the warmth of a reed hand. Your cablegram from the boat was a surprise. Was it? I thought you would not leave on a Lulu. wouldn't risk a trip. Why not? Um, my heart. Oh, my poor chop. <laughs> uh, perhaps I'll outlive the doctors. Your voice, it's, it's changed. For, for the better? It's deeper. I'll blame it on the, on a little climate. Even your speech. What, about that? 
It lacks uh, the real refinement. I'll blame that on a little English. They make a professor talk like a customer in six months. Well, it's been a, a long time, Uncle. Yes, it's been a long time. I'd like to retire. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, of course, you'll want to be rested tomorrow for your cousin Margaret's arrival. Margaret? She's coming tomorrow? Yes. How is Margaret? Oh, she's grown into a fine woman. She'll make you a good wife, Doc. When do the wedding bells ring out? The day you take your inheritance, as your father wished it. You're displeased, Tom? No, it's uh, just that I never understood why my father made marrying a condition. The, the way I am. One jump ahead of the undertaker. Margaret's the daughter of an old school friend your father knew out east. You and Margaret were playmates as children, and your father wanted someone uh, close to have his money after you. Uh, this letter here is from Margaret. It came the other day. If you'd care to read it. Uh, thank you. I'll read it in bed. Uh, well, good night, nephew. Good night, Uncle Walter. Get three fives. Get the taste. Three fives by State Express. Get the taste of international success. The taste that's uniquely three fives. Only when no expense is spared in its making can a cigarette taste so right, so smooth, so satisfying. Three fives. Get the taste. The taste that State Express created for you. The taste that has made Three Fives the king-size cigarette of international success. Get Three Fives. Get the taste. some odds and ends. I'd left the village store when a fat little man in a seaman's outfit who'd been hanging about inside followed me out. I started up the car. And he drifted over. Going to White Oaks, Brent? Uh, how did you guess? <laughs> the car. It's the cab Reed hired yesterday. Can I catch a lift with you? You're going to White Oaks? Yes. Tom Reed's guest. Name is Brand. Right. I'll hop in. Are you a, a friend of Tom's? Well, I was purser on the ship he came over on. We hit it off. I got invited to his wedding. Friendly chap, Reed. Rich, but genuine. My mind worked at trip hammer speed. With every mile, the car brought me closer to reunion with someone who no longer existed. I had a choice of two things. Make a clean breast of everything, or stop Bran before he got to White House. I didn't have to choose. Bran made my mind up for me. He threw a sudden bombshell. 
What did you do with Tom Reed? Uh, well, I, I don't understand. You're wearing Reed's clothing, you're driving his car, you paid for some junk at the store, you showed Reed's wallet. You needn't swear. He can do business. Oh. How much? Half, if you're just masquerading. All, if you killed him. I didn't kill him. A heart attack did. I, I just stitched the body. Is it half? <laughs> I'll let you know. That's the way it's got to be. All or nothing. No deals with a blackmailer. Then it's all yours. Put your gun away. You're not going to shoot me in cold blood. I've got to. The way it is, I've got to. <laughs> he fell over on his side into the weeds. I'd done it. I'd added murder to masquerade. You didn't just stick your hand out for 100,000, I suppose. It came a lot harder than that. I dragged Bran through the woods, looking for a place to hide him until I could get some tools and bury him later. And suddenly, some motorist unable to get past my parked car on the narrow road. I left Bran as he was and ran to the car. For it was a girl, easy on the eyes, with a rainbow-colored scarf flying in the breeze. Move your car. I can't get by. Sorry. Were you hunting? H hunting? I heard shooting. I, I took a pot shot at some rabbits. Any luck? No, no, I'm a bad shot. Too bad. Am I on the right road to White Oak? You wouldn't be Margaret. Yes. I'm Margaret. Hello. I'm Tom Reed. You're Tom. Disappointed? Uh, don't mind my staring. I, I always stare. She wasn't just staring. She was accusing me with her eyes. Perhaps she knew I wasn't Tom Reed. She hadn't seen Reed since childhood, but maybe there'd been an exchange of photographs. I couldn't let her run blabbing to White Oaks. After Brand, I was up to my neck in it. There was no turning back anymore. Aren't you going to show me the way, Tom? The way you keep staring? Why? Just bad manners. But you're still staring. I'm... I'm sorry. She couldn't control her eyes. I followed the direction of her stare and then... Suddenly, it hit me. Murder was written all over me. There was blood on my clothes. It was as if Brand's corpse was standing beside me, telling the world. He came at a bad time. You, you killed somebody. In there. That's what those shots were. You killed Uncle Walter. Uncle Walter. And you're not Tom Reed. <laughs> You've got a picture of him? Yes. They're nice and frank. Well, why don't you scream? I'd rather do this. See exactly where you are. Do you know how to use it, that gun? Try me and see. Yes. Yes, I've got to try. Whether I like it or not, I've got to now. <laughs> nice shooting for a girl. My turn now. <laughs> she picked my elbow. I drilled it clean through the temple. Her shooting first made it easy for me. In a way, it was like self-defense. <laughs> I was still killing myself. Funny, I met a girl and killed her all in less than five minutes. The 100,000 was coming a lot harder than I'd thought. I drove her car and all as far into the woods as I could get and shot back to White Oaks. Playing air for a couple of days was out now. I was running out of time. The plan now was to grab what was in the safe one way or another and get as far from the two corpses and the blind uncle as I could get. I got to the safe and began to work at the dials. Uh, and then I heard Uncle Walter 
tapping his way towards me. John? John? Yes, sir. Give me your hand, give you. Where? Where is it? Here. <laughs> what do you do? Read palms with your fingers? Yes, nephew. There are flakes of dirt on your palm. As if you've had your hands on the ground. <laughs> Not bad. You ought to be a detective. And there's an odor. A smell of blood. Let go of my hand. What's wrong, John? Listen. I've got a gun in my hand. Pointing right at you. You're going to tap your way to that floor safe and open it. With no stalling and no questions. Perhaps no not. questions. But I don't know the combination from memory. You don't? If you listen, the combination is on a memorandum pad in the library desk. Get it. He tapped his way along the floor to the desk, stopped over the drawer, then stayed there in a crouch like a guy in a trench. There was a gun pointing in front of him. You crazy old fool. What good's the gun? You're blind. You'll not get a penny, imposter. Get over to that safe and open it up. Never. I'm counting three. One. Two. Better be. Look, oh. He'd shot me with perfect marksmanship. He'd aimed in the direction of my voice. I thought. I moved to the side quickly. Emptied my gun. I heard it on the shelf. Uncle Walter was propped over the desk. I did him in his cheek and neck. He was still alive. The gun pointing in front of him. I crept along the wall to the other side of the room, quietly. I didn't want him aiming in the direction of the sounds again. He aimed the gun. I watched the nozzle of the gun follow me, inching as I moved. The old man was looking at me, watching me, as if he could see it, as if he had perfect vision. <laughs> Uh, that, that's the Earl of it, Sergeant. You fixed a glycerine charge in a can and blew the wall safe? And that was a trick I picked up in prison. There were some chemicals in the storeroom at White Oaks. I thought I was going... To collect a fortune? Yeah. The old man, Uncle? Dead. He died of those bullet wounds you made. How did you... Well, what brought you... To White Oaks? The young lady. She came in and told us that you were trying to rob the safe. That you were likely to commit mayhem. The young lady? Sure. Uh, wait a minute. How did you describe this, uh, Margaret? A rainbow-colored scarf. What color hair did she have? Auburn. Auburn. Gray eyes. Auburn hair. That's... Uh, that's impossible. Uh, 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 don't die. You can't die. Uh, this uh, girl. Ghost, don't you? Uh, a ghost. Uh, hey. <laughs> hey. What's this? Who's that laughing? Uh, doctor, did you hear that? I know. She. Uh, did you hear that, Doctor? Well, he's dead. This young man is dead. But the girl, she spoke. Well, I didn't hear anything. You must be imagining things. <laughs> international success. The taste that's uniquely three fives. Only when no expense is spared in its making can a cigarette taste so right, so smooth, so satisfying. Three fives. Get the taste. The taste that State Express created for you. 
The taste that has made Three Fives the king-size cigarette of international success. Get Three Fives. Get the taste. This is your host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? Through the creaking door, of course. <laughs> the manufacturers of State Express 3.5's Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present... Resolution 1841. My name is Laura Cabot. It is January 2nd, 1942. The second day of a new year. As I speak these words, even I myself can't believe that what has happened is true. It began only a few short hours ago, less than 48 to be exact. And yet, it has changed everything for me, even life itself. I must tell someone... And so, I'm telling you. It all began night before last, New Year's Eve. A number of us had braved the deep snow and cold north wind to go out to the old Cabot place, north of Quincy, to see the new year in. There were four of us. Ed and Helen Richards, who had just been married a year, and a business friend of Ed's named Duke Toback. We had to leave Ed's car down at the road and walk up the narrow, unused lane leading to the big brick house. Oh, talk about 1941 leaving with a vengeance. Oh, it's cold, isn't it? Oh. The snow's drifting deeper. Oh, Helen, to the right, dear. The house is over there. All right, Laura. I, I didn't know we'd have to walk. <laughs> Yeah, it'll, it'll be good for us. I wonder what your friend must think of us. Out like this on New Year's Eve. Uh, Duke? <laughs> oh, Duke's a good sport. Besides, dear, haven't we made a practice of spending New Year's Eve in the old Cabot place for the last three years? <laughs> yes, Ed, we have. Besides, Duke wouldn't want to spoil the fun. Anyway, I think that he makes a fine partner for Laura, don't you? Yes. He's very handsome. And wealthy. Helen, do you think she likes him? <laughs> well... The way she's hanging on to him and laughing, I wouldn't exactly say she hates him. <laughs> oh, Mr. Toback, you certainly must think that we're idiots. I wish you'd call me Duke. I've been calling you Laura all evening. Well, I, I guess it's because I'm so fascinated by your last name that I use it. Uh, tell me, how do you spell it? Just like it sounds. T-O-B-A-C. Duke. Yes, Laura? Spell your last name backwards. Hmm? Toback. Spelled backwards is Cabot. 
my name. I say you're right. Well, that's the most unusual thing I've ever heard of. Well, I'm an unusual person. Are you? Don't you think so, Laura? I really haven't had time to decide yet. But I'm awfully glad you came along with Helen and Ed tonight. We do this every year, you know. Yes, so Richard's told me. Oh, this old house has been in my family for more than a century. It was just three years ago that I discovered it belonged to me. That's so? Mm-hmm. Oh, there were back taxes galore on the place. But I paid them up. And every New Year since then, the Richards and I have spent New Year's Eve A here. charming custom. You know, I rather think I'm going to enjoy being let in on it. I hope so, Duke. Really, I do. I want this to be the best New Year's Eve we've ever enjoyed. Helen? Helen, you and Ed, wait up. Or you'll have to stand at the door till we catch up with you. All right. Duke. What's wrong? Laura, wait. What is it? Is... Is that the house? Why... Why, yes. Why? I... I don't know. It seems so familiar looking. I've seen it before. Someplace. Well, if you've seen it, it's been right here. Come on, Laura. Unlock the door. Oh, uh, all right. H here's the key. Here, I'll open it. There. In you go, Laura. Oh, for heaven's sake, Ed, come in and close that door. Yeah. Hurry, dear. Nose blowing into the place. Here, old man, let me give you a hand with that door. Uh, uh, thanks. Ooh, there. Ooh, quite a wintry blast. Hmm. Here, stomp off the rug on this rag, uh, the snow on this rag rug. That's what it's for. Good enough. Oh, boy. Oh, it's nice and warm in here. Yes, I'm surprised. You been out here earlier today? No. Oh, Mr. Johnson owns the farm across the way. He always comes over on the last day of December and builds a fire for mm. us. You see, he expects us. The place seems so strange tonight. Strange? What, what do you mean, Laura? I don't know. Does it really feel warm to you folks? Well, it certainly does. Of course it does, dear. <laughs> it's fine. Boy, it sure makes it handy to come here and have the place all heated for us. <laughs> yes, but it doesn't seem the same in here as it always has before. Well, personally, I think it's very homey. Well, so do I. It's a pity no one lives here. It's such a nice place. I've tried to convince Laura she should stay here instead of renting in town. I've had this feeling before. It's so strange. Almost weird. Weird? Why, this place is far from being weird. Oh, of course. Oh, I'm just being silly. Well, come on, Helen, let's take our coats into the other room and see what condition the kitchen's in. <laughs> all right. Ed, you'd better throw a log on the fire. How about some refreshments all around, huh? Oh, you just leave that to us, gentlemen. There are plenty of refreshments in the kitchen. <laughs> yes, indeed. Laura and I had them sent out yesterday. Smoke, Duke? No, oh, thanks. Hey. Well, how do you like her? Laura? Mm hmm. Charming. Oh, <laughs> oh now, Duke, is, is that all you've got to say for her? Well, I, I haven't known her but a few hours. And yet. Yes, Duke? Yet. It seems that I have known her before. Somewhere. Sometime. <laughs> What makes you think that? I... I can't say. Something about her. The way she acts. The way she talks, possibly. I... I don't know. Well, have you asked Laura if she'd met you before? Oh, I, I thought that rather a silly thing to say. Besides, that that's what men always say to women when they're trying to make conversation. And, well, Laura's very easy to talk to. She talks so... so comfortably with me. And, well, it's as though she'd known me someplace before, too. Hmm. Yeah, I know how you feel, Duke. I felt the same way about folks I'd just been introduced to. Mm. Sensations like that are hard to explain. Yeah, they're generally not explained. Look here, Duke. This is your first trip to Quincy, isn't it? Not only my first trip to Quincy, it's my first trip to Massachusetts. Well, now, Laura's lived here all her life. She's been away a summer or two on vacation, though. Possibly you met her then. Yes, that could be the answer. But it does seem we've been acquainted before. And the strangest part of it all is... It seems that we were once very close to each other. Very close. Oh, 
Oh, Helen, will you juice these oranges for me, please? Mm -hmm. How many? Oh, half a dozen to begin with, I guess. Oh, come on over here on the small table. Oh, all right. Lara? Yes? What do you think of Duke? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Give me a little more time. He seems to be attracted to you. Does he? Does he indeed? I caught him three times staring at you like... <laughs> well, with a sort of fascination. Like he couldn't get used to you. <laughs> Well, perhaps you're right. Maybe he can't get used to me. No, oh, no, I didn't mean that way. I I mean, well, he stared at you like he was trying to remember something. Yes, I noticed that. And I caught you staring the same way at him. Yes. What is it, Laura? I don't know. You like him all right, don't you? That's just it. I feel that... Suddenly, I like him too much. <laughs> oh, now, you needn't fall in love with him right off the handle. Oh, no, it isn't that. It's a different kind of a feeling. An affection, but not the kind a woman has for a man. It's different from that. I don't understand what you mean, Laura. I wonder if I understand what I mean myself. It... It's something that seems to draw me very close to him. Oh, love at first sight. I've always believed in it. No, not that. Something else. Something different. Something greater. He hasn't made love to you already, has he? Helen, will you please stop talking about love? <laughs> love has nothing to do with it. <laughs> Laura, you need a lift. Come on, let me fix you one. No, not now. You know, Helen... I'm positive I've never met Duke Toback before. And and yet it seems that I did know him once a long, long time ago. Well, it couldn't be very long ago. You're only 23. No. I mean, farther back than that, even. Hey, wait a minute. His name. It's so strange. Toback. It's so very strange. Eleven thirty. No, just thirty more minutes, then it's goodbye, nineteen forty-one. Mm, I can't wait. I've had enough of the past three hundred and sixty-five days. I want a brand new year to start out everything with a clean slate. Now you're talking, Laura. Here's to nineteen forty-two. Yes, here's to the new year. Well, hey, I'm in on that. <laughs> May all our troubles disappear like bubbles of champagne. Uh, especially as quickly as the bubbles in any champagne that might be left around our place. <laughs> <laughs> Would you pardon me now? I want to go upstairs for a moment. I'll go with you. Oh, no, dear. It's cold up there, and besides, I won't be but a moment. Helen, you've got work to do in the kitchen. Well, I'll be right back. Yes, I'll only be a moment. Make yourself at home. She seems strange tonight, doesn't she, Ed? Yeah. You know, she, she was bright enough when we left town. But you know, the minute she stepped into this house tonight, something came over her. Well, I think she's quite attractive. Do you... Had you ever met her before tonight? Well, no, at least I... I don't think I have. Well, that's what she said about you. She did? Yes. She acted so strangely, too. She said she... Well, that you attracted her in a strange sort of way. <laughs> now, that's a pretty compliment. Oh, Ed. <laughs> what I mean, Duke, is... Laura told me she seems to have known you before somewhere. You know, that's odd... Duke just said the same thing about Laura, not more than 30 minutes ago. Duke, you mean that... Yes. It, it's so strange. I'm trying hard to remember. Well, I wouldn't worry about it. You know, I've had the same thing happen to me. Just some trick in nature. You meet a person, for a moment you'd swear you'd met him before. But isn't it strange that Laura should have the same feeling about Duke? Yes, I was about to forget the whole affair, but now... Well, I wonder... Well, now, my advice is that you two get together a little more. Talk over the places you've visited, places you've been. Now, I'll wager one of my Christmas ties you met at the seashore. Or at Santa Anita, or maybe on some dude ranch. <laughs> Possibly, Ed. But it doesn't seem that way. You know, I haven't said this before, but even this old house seems familiar to me. It does? Yes. When I first saw it outside, I stopped dead in my tracks. Something seemed to stop me and... 
Well, I'd have sworn I'd walked up that same lane out there dozens and dozens of times. Well, that's incredible. This, this room, with its high ceiling and huge fireplace, these pine walls, the heavy oak floors, the decorations, they all seem so vaguely familiar. But why should they? You've never been here before. No, I haven't. Don't you two think it's getting chilly in here? Yes, a little. Oh, there are no more logs. I guess I'd better go fetch a couple. No, Ed, I'll do it. Now, there's no reason for both of you to go out in the cold. Ed, you go. Isn't that just like a wife? No, Ed, you stay here. I know exactly (laughs) where the logs are. I saw them when I came in. I'll be right back with a couple. Uh, Better put a coat on, old man. No, I won't be out long enough. The wood's just around the corner of the house. Hmm? Oh, Laura, I didn't see you come back. Oh, he's gone to get some logs for the fire. Insisted on going alone. Laura, what a beautiful dress. Hey, those aren't the clothes you wore out here. Wherever did you find such a quaint outfit, darling? It's a dress my mother used to treasure. It's been in my family for almost a century. Oh, it's beautiful. I thought it would be fun to put it on tonight. I found it upstairs in an old trunk. (laughs) Just wait until Duke sees you in that dress. Maybe that'll help him remember where he knew you before. He... He thinks he's known me before. Uh, And and Helen says you feel that you've met him before, too. Well, yes. I do feel that way, but... Oh, I... I don't know what to think. I'm so upset tonight. Laura, what is wrong tonight? Ed and I have both noticed it. Yeah, what's wrong, Laura? Oh, I didn't want to mention it, but... There, something is wrong. Well, can we help you? No, I... I couldn't ask you to. Well, you two know how very fond I've grown of this old house and the property. Yeah. He certainly spent a lot of money putting it into shape. I still don't see why you don't live here. Oh, it's the memories and more than anything... And the fact that my grandmother and her grandmother and hers lived here for so many years. Oh, Laura, you don't mean you're going to lose the place. I'm afraid so. Oh. You see, it's heavily mortgaged. I'm in debt more than $3,000. I can't meet that debt. Hmm. Well, uh, that's a little more money than we've got right now. (laughs) Yes, quite a bit more. (laughs) Oh. What's that? Duke. Oh, Oh, Ed, see what's wrong, for heaven's sake. Don't just stand there. Hurry. Duke, Duke. Lord, man, your head. What happened? Speak to me, Duke. Are you all right? Here now, now, take it easy. I'll carry you into the house. Come on, now. Arm around my neck. That's it. Is he all right, do you think? Yeah. That's quite a pile of wood out there. Picked up a piece near the bottom and the lot slid down on him. Just knocked him out, that's all. Oh, he looks so pale. Here, here, loosen his collar. There. You better take your tie. That's it. Oh. Duke? Oh. Duke? Are you all right? Feeling better now, old man? I... What? Is something wrong? You had an accident, Duke. Do you feel all right now? Lauren. Yes, Duke? Lauren. Why'd you call me that, Lauren? Who... Who are these people? Duke, why, you, you'll be all right. Who are these people? What... Why am I lying here? Where is your mother, Lauren? You'll be all right now. Just lie still. Why do you speak like that? Why do you look at me like that, daughter? Daughter? But what's the trouble here? Suddenly you're so strange. It's you who are strange. What? You call your father strange? You call me Jeremiah Cabot strange? Jeremiah Cabot? Of course, Jeremiah Cabot. Don't tell me I have to remind you who I am. But Jeremiah Cabot was my mother's great-great-grandfather. Duke, for heaven's sakes... 
Well, what's the matter with you? This... This is so strange. I... I'm afraid I don't know your friends, Laura, and you, young lady. Or you, sir. Oh, now do cut the kidding. Just a moment, Ed. I... I think I'm beginning to understand. Oh. Oh. For a moment, child, I thought you were my daughter. Now I... Now I know the truth. You... Yes, that must be it. What, Laura? What on earth? Just a moment, Helen. Jeremiah Cabot. He built this house. His daughter was named Laurelin. The name has been in the family for a century. Laurelin. She looked so much like you. I still don't get this. Ed, wait, I... I think I can explain, at least partially. There's an old legend in our family that one New Year's Eve, Jeremiah Cabot was asked by his family to join them in making New Year's resolutions. In the spirit of jest, Jeremiah resolved one thing, to return to this earth 100 years from the night he made the resolution. That's it. Yes, of course. The resolution. The, the brick... In the fireplace, the brick. What does he mean? I remember now. Here, I'll show you. This brick. This one behind the others. See? It's loose. You can remove it. But what are you trying to tell us? Here. You see? A hiding place behind the brick. This is where the papers are hidden. And the money. No. <laughs> Will somebody please tell me what's going on around here? Ed, that's real money. Ten thousand dollars. You see, I... It has been hidden here for years. And here, pictures in the original deed to the Cabot property. This is most amazing. And this, this is what I was looking for. Here, Lauren, read this. Go ahead, child. Read it. What did it say, Laura? Do you want me to read it? No. Just a moment. It's quite faded. The ink is almost gone. It says, I, Jeremiah Cabot, being in my right and sane mind, do solemnly resolve this night to return to earth again exactly 100 years from now if it be within the realm of power signed Jeremiah Cabot December 31st, 1841. What, what happened? Is something wrong? What am I doing here? Oh, my head. Duke. Why are you all looking at me like that? Oh, I remember now the logs... Ooh, cold in here. Duke, where are you going? No, no, Ed, you stay here. I know exactly where the logs are. Saw them when we came in. I'll be right back. Resolution 1841. Tonight's tale of dark fantasy, written by Scott Bishop. Charles Carchon played Duke Toback. Manny Joe Curtis was Laura Cabot. Eleanor Naylor Corrin was Helen Richards. And Ben Morris 
played Ed Richards. Next Friday night at this same time, the National Broadcasting Company will bring you the eighth in this series of stories of the supernatural and the unusual, created for you by Scott Bishop. Listen for the weird and haunting The Curse of the Neanderthal, the story of a grave 40,000 years old, and the awesome secret that it contained. Dark Fantasy originates each Friday night in the studios of WKY, Oklahoma City. Tom Paxton speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. today is titled Gravestone. Need I say more? We bring it to you after a message from your station. And now, if you haven't already done so, turn off your lights, fasten your safety belts, and off we go on a holiday titled Gravestone. Hey, <laughs> that was swell. Now let's go to town. St. Louis woman with her diamond ring kicking that man oh, around. No. no, stop that, Kay. What's the matter? Am I scaring the horse? Oh, it seems like a sacrilege singing a song like that out here. This beautiful clean snow and blue sky. Well, what's wrong with a hot song to keep us warm? If you think the St. Louis blues is going to dirty up the snow, you ought to hear Frankie and Johnny the way I sing it. Oh, stop it, Kay. You're not funny at all. Why can't you enjoy the fresh air without that cabaret sort of thing? Oh, just an old-fashioned gal, eh, Florence? How about you, Edna? Don't you like my songs either? You haven't said anything for the last five minutes. Well, I, I haven't been listening to you to tell the truth. I love to watch the snow sort of... Flow along under the sleigh. When you say that, gal, smile. Gosh, did you ever see more snow in your life? The man at the hotel said it had been snowing on and off up here for two weeks. I think coming out here to the country is the best thing we three have done since we started rooming together. Hiking in the snow is terribly healthy. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. The healthier I get, the worse I feel. <laughs> Crazy idiot. She does say the funniest things, doesn't she? I always say that Kay ought to... Whoa! Hallelujah, we're here. Is this as far as we go, driver? That's right, miss. Can't go no further down this road account of the drift. Oh, my goodness. The drifts are too deep for a horse. How can we walk through them? I second the motion. Well, you young ladies don't have to worry none so long as you keep going down the valley over there. Snow ain't piled up that way all the way to Ma Jenkins. Oh, well, that's marvelous. Come on, girls. Let's get started. So long. Take care of yourselves, girls. Come on, Edna. Goodbye, Edna. Come on, Carol. Well, listen to the snow talking at us. It's very dry snow. Our feet rub particles of it together, and the friction makes a sound. It's kind of scary, yeah. isn't it? Why? Well, I don't know. It's just mm. as if the snow was sort of trying to talk to mm. us. I mean, 
as if it was angry at our trespassing. Hey, don't tell me we're trespassing. I don't want any country squire taking any pot shots at my uh, constitutional amendment with rock salt. No, thank you. Oh, don't talk nonsense, Kay. We're not trespassing. Why, this path through the valley here over to Mrs. Jenkins' house is the favorite hike of everyone who comes up this way during the winter. What's Mrs. Jenkins got anyway that makes people walk their feet off? <laughs> Wait till you taste her cooking. Eat. Oh, boy, let's go. It's awfully quiet out here, isn't it? Oh, that's the glory of it. I've had the roar of the subway in my ears so long. Okay, don't walk so fast. Come on, look what I found. Oh, come on, Edna. Oh, please, let me take your arm. I'm getting out of breath. Well, take it easy. There's no hurry. <sighs> well, what is it, Kay? Look, through the circle of trees here. Look what I discovered. Well, isn't that interesting? It's a sort of a natural amphitheater. Sure. Say, who was this guy, Daniel Boone? Well, What's an amphitheater? Well, that, that means an oval circling place with rising tiers of seats. It's, you know, like that place we went to for the horse show. Oh. Back in the times of the Greeks, they had outdoor theaters. Listen and to the professor. They made use of places just like this where the ground sloped up and made a sort of a natural arena or stage below. Theater. That's an idea. Sit down, gals, and I'll give you a special performance of the K Follies. Oh, it's awful snowy here, isn't it? I'll trample it down with my spring dance. Welcome, sweet spring. <laughs> she is not dancing in the snow. If I had that girl's energy, she's really graceful, isn't she? I'll bet if she went on the stage. Oh, Kay. Okay. Kay. Oh. Kay, did you hurt yourself? Oh, did I land on my dignity? Here, give me a hand. Here, I'll help you. There you are. Oh, did I take a flop? Did you hurt yourself badly? Oh, I'll live. What in the world did I trip over? Oh, no wonder. Look at that rock under the snow. No wonder I did a nosedive. Oh, my gee. goodness. There are rocks like that all over. Oh. A person could break their neck if they... Girls. What's the matter? What is it? Kay, the rock you tripped over. It... It's not a rock. What are you talking about? Of course it's a rock. Well, yes, but it's something... Something more than that. It's a tombstone. Oh. Tombstone? Oh, no, it, it can't be. Look it... for yourself. It says... Here lies buried the remains of one who, restless in life... Stop! Don't read anymore. Stop! And, and all these other stones laying flat on the ground. They're tombstones, too? Yes. Whew! What a place to pick to dance. Oh! What's the matter, Edna? What did you scream for? Kay, you... You danced on the grave. What? You danced on the grave. I saw you. I saw you do it. You danced on the grave. Okay. Edna, stop it. Stop it. Oh, what's come into her? Edna, stop that. Edna, like stop for heaven's sake. Control yourself. Okay. Okay, I'm so sorry for you. You danced on a grave. For heaven's sake, stop talking like that. Sure, I danced on a grave. Well, yes, of course she did. It was perfectly accidental. And what if it wasn't? What of it? Oh, the poltergeist. The what? Edna Hanson, what are you talking about? What's that word you just used? Poltergeist. Okay, what have you done? You superstitious little fool. If you don't stop talking that way, I'm going to slap your face. What's the matter with you? I didn't do anything. You walked on the grave. You danced on the grave. Oh, Edna, what? be sensible. We all walked on graves, but it was purely accidental. Yeah. We had no intention of desecrating them. It doesn't matter, I tell you. It doesn't matter. The poltergeist. He'll come. I know he will. Oh, what's the use? She's crazy. Edna, what are you talking about? What's the poltergeist? What are you so frightened about? My father, he told me. If you walk on a grave, if you dance on a grave, the poltergeist. Poltergeist what? What is a poltergeist? An evil spirit. It comes out of the grave. It kills and destroys. It'll kill us. It'll kill us all. Stop it. It's those things oh, that Oh, please. Yeah. Lay off that. Lay off that. Lay off that. But it won't get me. Oh, Edna, away. come back oh, here. Away. She's gone insane. I'll get her. Edna, okay, catch her. Edna. Edna, don't run away. Nothing will hurt you. Nothing. Oh, Edna, look out. <laughs> hey. Hey, what happened? That stone. It hit Edna. Edna. Edna, open your eyes. Blood. Blood all over her face. Kay, who threw that stone? Who threw it? I don't know. It came from the graveyard. Let's take a moment before we go on with our The Devil and Mr. O's story of gravestone and listen to a message. So, uh, Mr. President, what does it mean to say love makes all things new again? Love makes all things new again? Well, you see, 
somebody down in the dumps, that means they're very sad. I'd say, I care about you. And then they go, Pee-yo! Why is that? Well, when a person knows somebody cares about him, they just feel great. They just go, Pee-yo! Oh, I see. No, that's the same thing as love. What's the same thing as love? Caring about people. Well, suppose there were two people down in the dumps, Mr. President. Oh, I just say, I care about you, I care about you, and go pew, pew. Suppose 200 million Americans were down in the dumps, Mr. President. I'd say, I care about you, 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 I care about you. Love makes all things new again. Hey, what was that? Another sound of love from the Franciscans. We return you to the Devil and Mr. O story of Gravestone. <laughs> now, girls, take it easy. Take it easy. Oh, Doctor, she won't die. <laughs> Tell me she won't die. No, no, of course not. And you're sure that her skull isn't fractured? Oh, absolutely not. Maybe a little concussion, that's all. Well, it's almost five. Our train. Can we get someone to help us carry her down to the station so we can get her on board? Board? I'm telling you, that little friend of yours shouldn't be moved out of bed for a week. If you do, well, it might be just too bad. Oh, Flo, what'll we do? Uh, you go home, Kay. I'll stay with her. Oh, no, you won't. I'm not leaving you here alone in this godforsaken place. If you stay, I stay too. Kay, please be sensible. Why should we all lose our jobs when you... If can you'll go... excuse me, you ladies, I've got to be on my way. Oh, yes, of course, Doctor. Is there anything more you can do for Edna, Doctor? Any medicine or something? Nope, I've done all I can do. She's sleeping comfortable now. Uh, miss? Yes, Doctor? The constable's sick too, you know, and he's sort of depending on me to keep things straight. Now, uh... Just how did you say that little friend of yours got hurt? Well, it was just the way we explained, Doctor. That rock came flying and... Yes, yes, I know, but who threw the rock? We... we don't know. What? That's true, Doctor. We don't know. But somebody threw it. You can't change facts. Somebody threw the rock that cracked her head. For heaven's sakes, old man, you don't think we did it? No, okay, miss, I didn't. excited. Doctor, you've got to believe us. It happened just the way we said all at once, that rock came flying through the air from the direction of the graveyard. It struck at an end, and we just didn't see who threw it. All right, if that's your story. Well, you better stay in your rooms here. I mean, you better not be leaving until the constable's on his feet and has a chance to talk with you. I'll be back in a few hours and see how the girl is. He doesn't believe us. What difference does it make? We know what we saw. But what did we see? She was running. She she fell. Kay? Well, let's not fool ourselves. There was no one there to throw that rock. There must have been. But there wasn't. Stop saying that! Aren't you brave enough to face facts? There wasn't any place for anyone to hide. I saw that stone. It seemed to come down out of the air. So slowly. Florence, if you don't stop talking like that... I remember what... What Edna said? It throws things. Stop looking at me like that. You're giving me the jitters. She said the poltergeist throws things. Spirit of evil. Florence, Rob, have you gone crazy too? Why should we laugh at things like that? What right have we got to laugh? How do we know there aren't powers we can't see or understand? Powers of evil that revenge and insult just like an evil man... Kay, how do we know? What are you talking like that for? What are you trying to scare me for? You, you're you supposed to be the most intelligent one of us all. You with your college degrees. Sure, sure, I danced on the grave. But the dead are dead and they can't revenge a thing. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of anything. I tell you... No! What? It's Edna. Come on. Edna, we're coming to you. Don't be afraid. We're coming. Open the door, Florence. It's not locked. Duck, it won't Here, let me. Edna, what is it? What? Edna, what? On your head. Oh. 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 
Hey, what's going on here? I run a decent place, and I don't want you... <gasps> oh. The girl on the bed. Her head. It's crushed flat in by a rock. God in heaven. It's not a rock. It's a tombstone. I I wish I could cry. But I haven't got any more tears. Oh, Edna. Edna. Go on, darling, please. You'll kill yourself if you keep on like that. Oh, this horrible night would only end. It was my fault. Mine. I was the one who got her out here. She didn't want to go. She hates the country. But I made her come. I made her. No. No, you're not the one to blame. I am. I danced on the grave. But it was so good. So sweet. Oh, why does it have to be Edna? Why? You're right. It wasn't right for it to be her, was it? Oh, no. I did it, not her. I did it. I danced on the grave. I danced on the grave. You can't deny what you see with your own eyes. But I tell you, Doc, nobody could have carried that tombstone up the steps without me seeing him, could they? But there it is, ain't it? Yeah, there it is. Either somebody's playing a terrible joke or... You don't have to say it, Doc. I know. That's just the trouble. You don't know, and I don't know, and nobody knows. Yeah. And... And that tombstone. Well, what about the tombstone? I... I ain't quite sure, but... That's a tombstone out of the old burying grounds up at the bend. You're crazy. No, I ain't either. Well, that place is a good three miles from here. Yeah. I know. Who could have carted a heavy stone like that for three miles? Yeah. Who? Stop looking like that, you flap-eared old fool. Human hands carried that stone in here and killed that girl? Sure. Yeah, the constable will find out who did it the minute he's on his feet again. You wait and see. No, he won't, Doc. You're smarter than me and all that, but... Oh, this time you're wrong. There ain't nobody that takes in breath and leaves out breath like you and me... Or the constable's going to find out who killed that girl. You know that, Doc. No, oh, stop talking. I wish the constable was here and this night was over. It's been a terrible night. Terrible. Terrible clock. Ticking. Ticking. Yeah, I know. I've been sitting here listening to it. I can't stand it anymore. I'll stop it. Why bother with it? Come on to bed, Kay. Please. There's no use sitting there. It won't help her. Yeah. Nothing can help her. But maybe I can help you. Me? It was my fault. Mine. I was the reason it happened. It killed her, and it'll kill you and me, too, unless I stop. No, don't say that. It's true. But why should you be hurt? I'm to blame, not you. Listen, Flo. I'll go out there. There? Out there to the graveyard. What? I'll talk to her. Kay. I'll, I'll tell her I didn't mean to do it. No. But I didn't know where I was dancing. Please. Maybe somehow it'll hear, listen to me, and... And then it won't hurt Oh, you. no, no. I won't let you go out there. It'll kill you. It'll kill, it'll kill you, too. No, no, I'll hold you. You can't go. You can't. All right. Come on to bed, Kay, please. In the morning, in the morning, things will be different. But it won't. Nothing will hurt us. And then they're right outside the door. They won't let anything get at us. Oh, please, Kay, please come to bed. Yeah. We'll, we'll pray. Pray? I... I don't exactly know how. Just say anything. Anything. Like this. 
Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now you, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. anymore. Kay, tomorrow, I mean, when it gets light and everything, do you think people will believe us? Do you think so, Kay? I, I'm not quite sure what happened. I always used to be so sure about things. And now I... Kay? Kay, where are you? Kay, where... The window. She went out the window. Going out there to the graveyard to talk to it. Okay, why did you go? Why did you go? I'll go out there too. We should be so frightened out there alone. I'll go too. I'll go too. Oh, so cold. My hands. Snow so sharp. Cutting my legs. Oh, why did you go out there, Kay? Why did you? I've got to find you. The wind. Oh, why does the wind stop? Blow, blow that winter wind. Thou art not so unkind. <laughs> I've got to find you, Kate. I've got to find you. It's snowing. I love snow. And I didn't like snow. Where are you, Kate? Where are you? I lost my way. I lost the road. Where are you, Kate? talk to it. We'll talk to it together. We'll say that we didn't mean any harm, won't we, Kay? Won't we? Oh, Edna. We can't help her, Kay. We can't help Edna. But I'm coming to help you, Kay. I'm coming. I'm coming. Yes, I hear you. I hear you. I'm coming, darling. I'm coming to help. I'm coming to help you. I'm coming. I'm coming. I hear you. I hear you calling my name. I hear you. Yes. Yes, I hear you. I hear you. Where are you? Where are you? This way, Hooper. They must have come this way. <laughs> Climbing out the window like that in the middle of the night. They must have gone crazy, the both of them. Well, let's not worry about that now. We've got to find them. Here, give me that lantern. What is it, Doc? What have you found? A shoe. One of the girl's shoes. My gosh, stuck in the snow. We're going the right way. Come on, move fast. <laughs> We've got to get to them. Doc, look at this. What is it? Over there. Ain't these footprints? Yes. Yes. Yes, that's right. Footprint. Hello, up ahead. Hello. Doc, we're... We're getting pretty close to the old burying ground. Well? Maybe... Oh, look here, Doc. Let's not be fools. Let's wait till morning. What? Let those frightened girls freeze to death? Get along. But, Doc, I... You uh, come uh, with me or the whole town will know what a yellow-livered no-good you are. All right. All right. You don't have to get so sore, Doc. Hello? Hello? 
Anybody up there? Hello? Doc. Doc, look. What? There they are. Up ahead. Glory be, they're alive. The both of them. Come on. Doc. Doc, look at them. That's the burying ground up there. And they're dancing. Dancing on the graves. What? They must be out of their heads. Come on. We've got to stop them. Doc! Doc, wait for me! Oh, Doc, it's... It's Doc again. Where are they, Doc? Where are the girls? Have they... Have they stopped dancing? Yes. Huh? They've stopped dancing. Did... Did they ever dance? What are you talking about, Doc? We saw them. We saw them dancing in this place with our own eyes. Did we? The moonlight. Here it comes again. See with your eyes again. <gasps> things happen? Well, mischievous, revengeful spirits doing all that sort of thing? In Africa once, I saw a native chief's home where rocks and pans and everything else were flying through the air, and no one was in the room. No one. I, too, have only questions, no answers, except about our next story, after a short message from your station. These are underwater recordings of the humpbacked whale, now almost extinct. Why save the whale? We no longer need whalebone or blubber. But today, as man seeks how to adapt to life underwater, the whale has much to teach. How it navigates, why it sings, what it may be saying. For the whale, like man, is a mammal. Efforts to save this great beast may just be turning the tide. The American Museum of Natural History is playing a leadership role. There are 200 scientists at the museum dedicated to the preservation of all animals, including man. Come see our exhibition, Never Say Die. It's the story of the endangered species. The American Museum of Natural History, 79th and Central Park West, open every day. This is Mr. O again. Our next play in the series is titled Ancestor, and it's a ghost story, pure and simple. A girl is being held captive by criminals, and as she tries to... <laughs> but that's next time. Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension X. <laughs> <laughs> 
When man first crossed the vast distances of outer space to land on strange worlds, he found that someone had been there before him. The ruined canals of Mars, the smashed cities of Titan and Centaurus 2 and 3, all these were evidence that 100,000 years ago, a race of intelligent beings built their cities across the galaxy. They knew space travel, atomic power, astrophysics, and engineering. And then they destroyed themselves, completely, so that of all the cities on a thousand worlds, only dust and rubble remained. Why? Why did these beings obliterate all record of themselves? That is the mystery of the lost race. The freighter Carilia, bound out of Earth for Cetus Alpha 2, came into normal flight after 103 days in overdrive. The stars were unfamiliar. The constellations known on Earth had disappeared. But there was a yellow sun off the port, and about it revolved three planets. What do you make of it, Briggs? It isn't on any of the star charts, Captain Wharton. I checked through. One and three are dead, all right. I have to take a closer look at number two. Turn up the vision scale. Hmm, polar ice caps. She's green around the belt. Let's take her down to a five-mile orbit. Swing around her for a look. Alert for deceleration. Aye, sir. Throw in the manuals. Power room. Power room, aye. We're going down to have a look at something. Give us just enough power to keep her under control. All right, Briggs. Hang on to your stomach. You sent for me, Captain Morton? Come in, Mr. Howell. I... Do you mind if I... Sit down. Free fall sickness? Well, I'm afraid I'm not an old space hand. Oof. We'll level out in a minute. Do you want something? Yes. We come out of overdrive, smack in the middle of a new planetary system. Briggs says it's unreported. Well, that's rather good news, isn't it? Depends. Chris report's pretty common. But we'll stake a claim on her, in case there are any mineral discoveries. Well, I meant the possibility of archaeological finds. I'm afraid I'll leave that to you, Mr. Howell. You're the expert. Coming up five, Captain. Level off. Hang on, Hal. Power room. Hold her steady, she goes. We'll orbit at slow cruising speed. All right. Clear the scope, Briggs. Aye, sir. Hmm, nice looking piece of real estate. Well, the space guard requires I check her for radioactives, gold, and lost race rooms. You're landing? Landing. I've got a schedule to keep, Mr. Hal. I can't sit down in every lump of dirt I run into. We'll do a spectroscope check, and I figured you'd spot any ruins. All right. Wait a minute. Hmm? There in the lower quadrant. What? That bald spot in the vegetation. Those are ruins, all right. Are you sure, How? Yes. I've seen the lost race rubble on Centaurus, too. There. You can see it plainly, dust and rubble. Oh, that's what I get for calling in an expert. Briggs. Stand by to take it down to 5,000 feet. Aye, sir. All this stinking luck. There goes my schedule. <laughs> Seen enough, Howell? It's going to set me back five hours. Interesting. Wait a minute. What's wrong? I, I don't believe it. Marvelous. It... Incredible. Stop sputtering, How? What is it? Look over that rise in the ground. It's hmm? a section of the city still standing. Hey, you're right. That hill must have shielded it from the blast. Captain, you've got to land. Land? You've got to. This is the first lost race site that's ever been spotted, of course. You'll land. Howell, we get a thousand dollar bonus for every day under par for the run. But you don't understand. It's the biggest find in the century. We can chart it, and you'll have to get back somehow. But... That's all. Not sitting down to rake over old dust heaps. Captain Wharton, I'm on commission to the space guard. You may have to answer to them. I'll think up one. Look, Howell. Strictly speaking, you're a passenger. Well, you've got you to land. You don't belong on the bridge. I'm not landing down there. I'm not... Breach! Emergency from the power room. Something must have blown. Power room. Power room. Danton, what's wrong down there? Danton! He doesn't answer. Anything serious, Captain? He reaches the fuel locker. That five pounds of ascending will go and kick us right out of space. Denton! Denton! Power room, I. What happened? What blew? Main tube coupling. 
She secured What's now. the damage? The main tube's burnt out. The bearing, the coupling, the injector valve, and the needle gauge. Can you make repairs? Not in flight. Can you raise enough power to land? I don't know, Captain. The wiring shot. It's flat like a tomcat. I might be able to get something from the deceleration auxiliaries. Get a jury rig on her. We'll try to set her down. Aye, sir. Briggs. Yes, sir. Alert for crash landing. Signal room. Signal room. Signal, aye. Langston, get off a position fix and SOS standby. Aye, sir. Well, Mr. Howell, I guess you're going to join your friends in the lost race. I just hope it's not permanently. Leveled off now, Captain. Turn her up a point. That's it. She's bucking bad. Five more minutes and the whole plates will shake loose. Power room. Stand by for bow blast on signal. Power ready. I'm going to try for that clearing. Too narrow. Two to one for a dollar. All right. Hang on. Briggs! Briggs! Oh, you all right? My head on the panel. Well, uh, I seem to be uh, all assembled. Well, we're down. Guess our luck hasn't run out yet. <phone rings> Calling power room. Power room, right. All right down there? Yeah, I'm all right. Stanton, I want a complete damage check and repair estimate. Get up here as soon as you got it for me. Briggs, you all right now? Yes, sir, I guess so. As soon as we get Dan's report, get a detail aft, help him with repairs. <laughs> Captain Wharton. What is it, Langston? My speaker line's out. Sending circuits blew. Spare tubes? Uh, that was a pretty rough landing, Captain. They're gone. I can't replace them this side of Lunar Space Station. I see. Well, the SOS ought to do it. And the Space Guard Monitor reports out They aren't with... going to, Captain. Why not? Sending circuits went out when the blast went off down there. I didn't get the SOS out. Thank you, Langston. Get back and see what you can salvage. Does that mean bad news? We were in overdrive, Mr. Howell. It would take 40 years to search the distance we've traveled in one day. Consequently, when the ship doesn't make port and doesn't transmit a position fix, they forget about it. Oh. I see. And with the radio out, we blast off on our own power. Or we don't get off. Got your damage report, Captain. Well... Here, it's on a B-23 checklist. Mm. Not bad? Worse. Stanton, uh, how long will it take you for repairs? I don't know. An estimate. I know gypsy fortune teller. How about the lifeboat? For deep space? What are they teaching at Sands Point now? Basket weaving? Stanton, Lifeboat I... couldn't lift half a light year off this here mud heap. Stanton, I'll take just so much... Can it be converted to Bessendium Drive? Converter links were mashed when we came down. How long is it going to take you to repair the main drive? Look, Captain, I got two hands. You want me to hold a lug wrench in my teeth? See here, Captain. You stay here, Captain. The whole lousy crew's been spitting all over me ever since we blasted off. Now you can all wait on me. Who do you think you are, Captain? The only power man on this ship, that's who. You ain't satisfied with the way I'm working? Go hire yourself another boy. The woods are lousy with him. Take my own sweet time. What's the matter with him? Got a bug in his ear? Space fatigue, Captain. He's been locked up in the power room four days. Oh, we don't have enough trouble. Briggs, remind me to slug the psychotechnician when we get back. Don't tell me nobody gets into deep space who isn't emotionally stable. What are you going to do about him, Captain? Nothing. Stay off his back. Oh, but you can't... Captain's the only man who can get us out of here. We want to hit the cradle at New York Spaceport again. We've got to keep him happy. Captain Wharton, as long as we're landed and we do have to wait for the engines to be fixed, I suppose we can explore the lost race ruins. I'm Look, Mr. Howell, I can't spare the men. We are now stuck tight until Danton gets those engines fixed. And if he can't, which is entirely possible, we are stuck, period. Oh, I... Oh. Briggs... I want you to keep a careful eye on the men. Space fatigue is nothing compared to what we might run up against now. Captain Wharton. Captain, I've got it. The sending circuits? No, uh, no, sir, but I picked up the incoming video band. Well, that's something. Uh, 
Can you get the mail call through? A man could use a little lift right now. Well, the scheduled one-way personals are due at 2330 Greenwich. Good. That ought to help morale. Langston, uh, rig the receiving booth. Aye, sir. Oh, this is a break. Seeing the folks at home may be enough to keep everybody on an even keel. I know I'll be glad to see that kid of mine. Mr. Langston, get Hanson out of the booth. You wear the glass right off the tooth. Now, take it easy, Williams. Everybody gets three minutes. Hey, Kelly, I bet that dame of yours burned up a circuit, huh? How'd you know it was his girl? You can't tell through the booth. Well, who else would call that ape? What'd you say, mm. Kelly? Oh, nothing. She don't have to. She just stands in front of the pickup tube and... Oh, brother! <laughs> <laughs> I can just see that. Hey, hey, it's a boy! A boy! Alice had a boy! What? They're gonna show him to me in the circuit tomorrow. Oh, Congratulations! <laughs> on, Who's next, Mr. Langston? Uh, the last call's coming through now on ticker. It's for Williams. Well, hey, wait a minute, Williams. Well, let go of my arm. What man? happened to my call? Uh, no call today, Dan. You're a liar, Langston. Hey. My girl calls in every scheduled circuit. That must be mine. Now let go, Dad. Maybe Janie was busy waiting tables in the lunchroom. What do you know about her, Hanson? You kidding? She's a swell kid. Everybody at New York Spaceport knows her. Yeah, I've yeah. seen you hanging around Jane, too. Now, wait a minute, Danton. Take it easy, Danton. You and Williams made this up between you, didn't you? You're going to take my call, huh, Williams? You're space happy. You used to hang around with her before I cut you out. Now listen, Danton, you were lucky enough to get her. Let well enough alone. You bet I got her all right, and you're not going to steal her back. Williams, I'm going to... Are you crazy? Danton! Get him off of me! Lion. Get him off! Oh, what's what's going on in here? Let him fight! I'm you, you double crush him! Behind my back! Grab him, Hanson, get his Let's arm. Let go me! Nobody took your call. Now, calm down, Dad. Right I'll fix all of Look out. He's got a wrench. Hanson! <laughs> He's nuts! Ah, nobody gets a call. Nobody. How do you like that, Williams? You ain't gonna hear from Janie no more. How do you like that? After him! Kelly! Hanson! The airlock. He's left the ship. Let him go, the jealous screwball. Sure. But that's the only man who can get us off of here. I warned you, so help me, Briggs. I warned you to keep an eye on Dampton. Well, I didn't think he'd go off this way. Well, it's that girl of his, sir. He's crazy jealous about her. Any reason for it, Williams? No, sir. She's a good kid. Too good for Danton. I guess he's just so afraid of losing her to some other guy, he, he's getting psychopathic about it. Well, we've got to get him back. I want every man equipped and ready for search parties immediately. Aye, sir. Williams, rig some portable searchlights and issue hand blasters and radiation tickers. Kelly. Aye, sir. You had the second party. If you find Danton, send up a signal flare. Aye, sir. Unless we do find him, we'll be on this planet until the next freighter stumbles on us. Maybe 10,000 years from now. <laughs> That light up, Hanson. This is amazing, Captain. Lost race buildings actually standing. Hey! What is it? Oh, it's nothing. A shadow. This place gives me the willies. To be able to find out so much about them, their science, art, what they looked like, perhaps even why they destroyed themselves. I'm beginning to wonder about that, How? You sure they destroyed themselves? Maybe they lost a war to another race. Uh, the winners would have left traces. Genghis Khan, the Mongol emperor, left a pile of skulls as a monument after he destroyed his enemies. But there's been nothing like that found. No clues at all, Nothing. Eh? When they decided to wipe themselves out, they did a thorough job. But why? That's what we've been asking for 50 years. They wanted to end like that. Captain, there's a rise ahead. Keep going. Anything on your side, Briggs? No, sir. Hanson, what is it? I don't know, sir. It's a funny kind of a glow. I guess I shot without thinking. No, get trigger, Happy. Howell. Yes? Where do you think the light is coming from? Down there. It's an amphitheater. Stone seats and a hood. Uh, it looks like a band shell. What's up, Captain? Wait a minute. Well, Howell? I don't know. That's the lost race sign on the hood. A what? A sort of hieroglyphic. The only thing we'd ever found before. One in each ruin. What does it mean? Some kind of a warning, I think. Come on. We're going down there. Careful now. There's a 
platform of some kind down there. Looks like a lecture platform, doesn't it? Or an altar. This might have been a temple. Perhaps the lost race sign had a religious significance. It looks like a throne to me. A throne five feet high. Briggs, climb up there. And see if there are any controls for this machinery. Hi, sir. Well, this wasn't meant for any man to sit on. There's a lever up here. Shall I try it? Sure, go ahead. Hey, what the... What's that mist? It's like a steam bath. I wonder if Kelly and Williams ran into hey, anything Kelly, like... Hold that light up. Shut up and keep looking for Danton. What? Look there, in the hood. It's Williams and Kelly. That crazy jet jockey. When I find Wait, him, I'm going to beat his brains out. You could see him, a three-dimensional image. Some kind of television. Get down, Briggs. Aye, sir. Did you see it, Skipper? I was just thinking about him, and there he was. And we all saw it. Out of the way. I'm going to try it. This thing can pick up Earth. It'll replace the receiver. Damn smashed. Just throw the lever, eh? What? That's my son. I'll be darned. His music lesson. Say, it reaches Earth all right. What? Imagine. Television... Without a transmitter. Looks like the lost race was ahead of us in more ways than one. Go up and try it, Howell. It's amazing, amazing. Television without a transmitter. This, this machine may be the clue to the mystery of the lost race. I'll try it. Mary, I've told you I like my paper first in the morning. Oh. If that youngster wants to know how the tigers did, let him wait until I am... My father in Detroit. Remarkable, Captain. You can see the whole room clearly. Say, how about me, Captain? Let me get up there. I'd like to see my baby. Alice told me all about it. Oh. What's the matter, Hanson? I kicked something, a wrench. Well, hold it up. What? It's Danton's. That means he's been here. We're on his trail, all right. Come on, Hal, let's go. Oh, but the baby wouldn't take a minute, Captain. Later, you... Hanson. We've got to find Danton first. All right, now, let's get moving. Hold it. What's that? The recall flare. Kelly and his men have found Danton. Oh, I hope that crazy fool is in one piece. We start back now, Captain. Yes. That came from the ship. Another flare? No, that was an explosion. That's all we need now. Something more to happen to the ship. Oh, it's the main shots. Smashed flat. Of all the sleeping rot. Check through the ship for further damage. Aye, sir. Oh, look at those plates. Crumpled like an accordion. Captain! Oh, Captain! Here comes Kelly's party. We got him. We got Danton. Hold it. What happened here? Somebody blew up the main jets. Danton, do you know anything about this? No, sir. Not much, he doesn't. He's crazy enough to blow us all up. Listen, Hanson, I admit I went off my head tonight, but I'm not crazy enough to commit suicide. The jets are smashed. We're all marooned up the same creek. I still think he's got something to do with it. Lay off, Hanson. We found him wandering up in the hills. And he was with us when the blast went off. Yes, that's right. We saw your recall flare before the explosions. Oh, I guess that puts Danton on the clear. Well, then who did it, Captain? I don't know, how. Looks like somebody didn't want us to leave this planet. Well, we still got one slim chance left. If we can repair the lifeboat... Skipper, it's gone. Gone? The escape port is open. The boat's missing. Oh, what else? The arms chest was cleaned out, sir, and the fuel locker was jimmied open. The sendium bars are gone. You sure? You look for yourself, sir. She's clean. I see. There's only one answer left. There's something or somebody out in those ruins trying to get us. Maybe that lost race decided they weren't going to stay lost. You think some of them may, may still be alive? Who else could have blown up our ship? Blaster up, Hal. And be careful. It's a hair trigger. What are we doing back at the television machine, Captain? I thought we were looking for the lifeboat. We are. Whoever blew up the ship must be around here. Might as well try to use the machine to track them down. Yeah. Yeah. Catch them with their own gadget, huh? That's right. All right, Hal, you're the expert. Get up there and try to find them. I hope it works. Well? I'm trying, Captain. Nothing but mist. 
I don't understand it. It reached all the way to Earth before I saw my father in Detroit. Mary, my paper's all rumpled again. What? There it is again. My father in Detroit. I've told him time and time again, I don't like a messy paper. Look at that. No selector control, yet all the way to Earth. You can see the whole room, the goldfish bowl, the, the antimacassars on the chairs. Yet we can't pick up something less than a mile away. Knock it off, Hal. We're wasting time. Come on. That gadget won't work. We'll have to comb these rooms inch by inch. I don't understand. Neither do I. We'll cut behind the hood here and go on. Briggs, you take the lead with the radiation ticker. We might be able to pick up a reading on where the rocket fuel is hidden. Aye, sir. All right, let's go. I can't understand why that machine can pick up earth and not... Help, help, Captain! Briggs, what is it? Captain, help, I'm falling! It's a cave-in. Hang on, Briggs. I'm slipping, Captain. Grab his wrist. All right. Now Got pull. Him. Pull. Uh, higher. Higher. Uh, higher. Oh. What happened? Huh. I was just walking along and the ground caved in. What? It's some kind of shaft. Hold your light over it, Captain. Oh! Fifty feet deep in a stone bottom... I could have split my head open like a grapefruit. Something down there. Hold that light steady. Amazing. Amazing. Looks like a pile of bones to me. Two piles. They may be the first skeletal remains ever found of the lost race. I've got to get down in there. We haven't got time, Hal. Come on. Let me have your binoculars. Wonderful. That small skeleton must be an infant. They've been laid out carefully at the burial chamber. The way they're lying, it's probably a mother and infant. Yeah. The tail, she's definitely anthropoid. Oh, you... you mean apes? Something like that. Yet they had atomic power and built cities across the galaxy. Amazing. Oh, we haven't got time. Hello, that's funny. The, the little one is different. The, the caudal bones are different. No tail. Listen, Hal... What do I care whether they had tails or not? Come on, now. It's almost as if... Well, they, they, they did have atomics, and radiation does funny things to heredity. They had that problem of mutations in Detroit. What? Detroit? That must be it. What? The new atomics plant at Detroit. They tore down my father's house to make room for it. Quickly, Captain. Oh, where are you going? Back to the machine. I've got a theory that may solve the whole mystery of what happened to the lost race. I don't care what happened to the dead ones, Hal. I want to find the living ones who wrecked my ship. I think this machine may give us both answers. There's the house, Detroit, down to the last detail. Oh, come on, Don. We know all but that. But don't you understand? That house was torn down. I got a letter before we lifted off Earth. It's gone. But it's on the television Captain, machine. Captain, that machine isn't television. It's a thought projector. What? It only mirrors what's in your own mind. But, Mr. Howell, we saw Earth. It was really there. But it was just because we imagined it, Briggs. It's a thought projection. I can produce any mental image that occurs to me on this machine. New York, spaceport, a space guard patrol, anything. Anything? Yes. And now I think I know what inspired the lost race to do what they did. It was fear. Fear of what was in their own minds. They could all see it with machines like this. But fear, fear of what? They foresaw the future. So they destroyed themselves. Every last one of them. Hold it, Howe. Are you sure they're all dead? 100,000 years ago. Then who blew up the ship and stole our lifeboat? Danton. Danton? But why? He was pathologically jealous. Yes, but blowing up the ship was like committing suicide. He wasn't crazy enough to do that. The lost race was after they looked at this machine. You mean Danton did too? We found his wrench here. You're right. He must have looked at the machine and thought it was television. He must have seen all his fears about losing his girl confirmed. That was enough to make him completely unbalanced. But he was with Kelly when that explosion went off. He's got an ironclad alibi. No, he hasn't. Wouldn't take a power man long to sneak back to the ship and rig a delayed action fuse. Howell, we've got to get back to the ship before Danton. Never mind, Captain. Stay right there. That's Danton. It's in the dark. You make a perfect target there. Stop your gun. I've got a blaster set at wide angle. Drop him. He's got his cold. I've been following you, Warden. I wanted to tell you, I'm going back to Earth. I got the lifeboat hidden over that ride. It won't work in deep space. <laughs> you believe me when I told you that, didn't you? Well, I've got it fixed. And with that percentium fuel, it'll be a milk run. 
I reached the space guard station at Volta with a long, sad story about how the rest of you exploded in mid-space. Damn, that's murder. Yeah, yeah, that's just what it is. And easy, too. Danton, you can't just leave us here. Watch me. Sit in front of that machine and watch me. Yeah, I know what it is. I know it's a television without a transmitter. And I did some checking up. I've seen how you were stealing my call. Trying to steal my girl. Danton, you're sick. You Pretty can't... Pretty smart, that lost race. They built some machine. And it showed me plenty. It showed me enough to kill you. Oh, you've got it all wrong. This isn't a television machine. What are you trying to pull, Warden? I saw it. Those were your own thoughts, Danton. Those things you saw exist only in your mind. Shut up before I blast all of you, Don. You're just trying to lie out of it, that's all. But I know the truth when I see it. And you're going to die. All right, Danton, but you're not going to get away with it. Look at the machine. What's that? The machine. It's the space guard patrol, Danton. Look, they're coming. X-3 to command. Spotted the Corellias reported. Preparing to land. That's the space guard, Danton. Yeah, whole patrol. You're lying, you're lying. They couldn't come. There wasn't any SOS. X-3 to command. Preparing to land. There's a clearing. That's enough, Howell. All right, Danton. They'll be coming over the horizon. Drop your gun and give yourself up. Oh, no. No, they're not going to catch me. I'll be away in that lifeboat before they land. Stand still, all of you. Stay where you are. I Danton. still got you covered. Danton, look out behind you. Ah! Burial shaft. He fell in it. Hold the light down, Briggs. Well? He's dead. Deader than the lost race. And what about those space guard cruisers? Out of my head. I just imagined them, and there they were on the machine. Poor Danton believed they were real. I wish they were real so we could get off this planet. No, it doesn't matter. We know where the lifeboat is now. We can send one man to bring back help. And it won't be Danton. The machine got him the same way it got the lost race. Through fear. But what was the lost race afraid of, Howell? Changing. Changing? Look at those skeletons down there. They had atomic energy, but they couldn't control it. Look, the baby is different from the other. The race was changing by mutation. Mutation? Look at those skeletons. Now imagine a shifted hip socket so they could walk upright. The baby was already without a tail. But how? That would mean they were changing into... Into... Yes, Captain. The lost race committed suicide rather than face the fear of seeing their descendants become such horrible creatures as men. You have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X. And now, about next week. William Travis and his wife thought they had escaped. But they were wrong. They were being searched out by men from another world. Men who wanted them to return. Where? I'll tell you... Next week. Tonight's drama was based on the Murray Leinster story, The Lost, and was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Matt Crowley as Captain Wharton, Roger DeCoven as Howell, and Joseph Julian as Danton. Your host was Norman Rose. Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? Surely you're not nervous. Perhaps a story might calm your nerves a little. A story about an undertaker and death. I call it 
stand in for death. My story begins in the small, dimly lit undertaking parlor of Charles Thompson. Thompson and his son, Paul, are listening to the news broadcast. As yet, there has been no further news about Tony Williams, a notorious gangster who less than an hour ago shot and killed Detective Walter O'Hara and fatally injured a six-year-old child in making his getaway in a stolen car. The entire police force is on the search for Williams. It is believed that... Yeah, to think that Tony Williams is our cousin, a man like that. Oh, Dad, you mustn't take it so hard. Uh, After all, it... No, I'll answer it. Tony. Yeah. Want the whole neighborhood to know I'm here. Lock the door and pull on the shades. Yeah. Hurry up. Why have you come here, Tony? What do you want? I need a hideout, and this is going to be it. No, Tony. I won't let you hide out here. You're nothing but a mad killer. Yeah? Tony, put away that gun. This gun's the reason you're going to hide me out here, you understand? Yeah. You understand? We you understand. And just do as I say, and you may live. I'll have to lay low here for a couple of days until the heat's off. I've had a chance to make some plans. Well, come, Paul. It's four o'clock. We must leave. Wait a minute. Where are you going? We're taking old Luigi Gambone to Woodcrest Cemetery to bury him. Woodcrest? Yeah. It's about five miles out of town, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Are there going to be any mourners at old Luigi's funeral? No. Luigi had no relatives. The city was going to bury him in a pauper's grave until we claimed his body. Ah, this gets better and better. Why are you so interested in old Luigi's funeral? Because old Luigi's funeral is going to be my funeral. What? What are you talking about? This. I'm substituting myself in a coffin for Luigi. All you two have to do is drive to the cemetery. There, I'll get out of the coffin and head for my hideout. After I'm gone, you bury the empty coffin and nobody will be the wiser. But, but Luigi's body, what do we do with that? That's your problem. No, oh, no, 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 I won't do it. You'll do as I say. It'll be three corpses in this room instead of one. Sure. Now dump Luigi out of that coffin and make it fast. We're starting, Tony. Okay. Remember... If the cops stop you, don't let him get suspicious or us. No, Tony, we won't. We'll... Paul, there's a man signaling us to stop. No trick. If you try anything, I'll come out of this coffin shooting, and the first two bullets will be for you. Be quiet, Tony. Here he comes. It's O'Hara, the private detective. O'Hara? The cop's brother? Yes. Now be quiet. Oh. Hello, O'Hara. Hello, Charlie. I thought it was you. Lucky I caught you. I was just going to drop in on you. Drop in? On me? That's right. Where are you headed for? We're going out to bury old Luigi at Woodcrest Cemetery. Old oh, Luigi, huh? Yes. I suppose you heard the latest about Tony Williams. Yes, I heard it over the radio. I, I'm sorry about your brother, O'Hara. He was a good man. Yeah. You haven't by chance seen Williams lately, have you? Uh, you know I've never had anything to do with Williams. Never. Sure, sure, Charlie. It's just that I thought you being Williams' cousin, he might just possibly have come to you for help. Oh, no, no. We haven't seen him in almost a year, have we, Paul? Uh, no. No, we, uh, we haven't. Oh, that's all right, Charlie. Say, do you mind if I ride along with you? Huh? There's a few questions I'd like to ask you about Williams and his habits. But I just got through telling you I haven't seen Williams in almost a year. What are you getting so excited about, Charlie? All I want to ask you is a few things about Williams. Get this. I'm going to see that Williams gets what's coming to him. And I'm going to be awful suspicious of anybody who doesn't cooperate with me. Well, you uh, mustn't mind my father. He always gets excited when someone mentions William's name. You know we'll be more than glad to answer any questions, Mr. O'Hara. Uh, yes, uh, of course, O'Hara. Uh, what do you want to know? You can get started, Charlie. I'll ride part of the way to the cemetery with you. You can answer my questions on the way. Uh, but, but we can talk here. We uh, we wouldn't want to take you out of your way. Oh, no, that's all right. You private dicks always have plenty of time. I think there's enough room for me to sit up front with you. Just slide over a bit, will you, Charlie? Uh, that's it. Uh, this is fine. All right, Paul. Let's be on our way to the cemetery. Dr. Weird's merry tale will be continued in a minute. Uh, which reminds me, Doctor, did you have a merry Christmas yesterday? Young man, don't mention Christmas to me. Why, what's the matter, Doctor? I was hoping to get a skeleton this year. but no Oh, one... Dr. Weird, I know just how disappointed you are. And gentlemen, if you were hoping for an Adam hat this Christmas but didn't get one, I can sympathize with you too. The new line of Adams this year certainly are tops in design and quality workmanship. So don't be disappointed. Get an Adam yourself. 
Walk into any of the thousands of Adam Hat stores or authorized dealers from coast to coast and try on a fine-looking Adam. There's an Adam Hat just for you, styled to bring out your best features. The soft-looking, genuine, all-fur felt and the smart new colors also add distinction to the wearer of an Adam. And remember, that fine array of hats you see in the Adam store window is on the shelves, too. You're sure to find the hat that's right for you in an Adam store. Now, here's Dr. Weird. Now I'll finish my story, stand in for death. The hearse has left the city behind and is nearing Woodcrest Cemetery. Mile after mile, Paul is driven in silence as O'Hara questions his father about Tony Williams. Well, here we are, O'Hara, the uh, entrance to the cemetery. Uh, oh, so we are. Uh, go ahead, Paul, drive in. Well, Harry, if, if you go into the cemetery with us, uh, how will you get back to town? Uh, that's all right. I don't mind walking from the grave back to the main road. Go ahead, Paul. Drive in. But, but, but O'Hara, you... Go ahead, Paul. What are you waiting for? Well, I'm certainly glad, Charlie, that you and Paul aren't mixed up in Tony's escape. You know, if you were, it'd mean ten years apiece for you in the penitentiary. Yeah. You know we wouldn't help a killer like Tony Williams? Sure, I know that. Guys like Tony have a way of intimidating people. Oh, but not me, oh. Yes, Charlie, even you. Tony's smart, and he has an even smarter lawyer. Remember when he was on trial for the murder of that state trooper? He beat that rap because witnesses refused to testify. Tony had intimidated him. Sure. And he was acquitted even though everyone knew he was guilty. Yes, but, but this time he wouldn't have a chance of escaping the chair. Now, I'm not too sure, Charlie. And even if he were convicted, let me tell you, the chair would be far too good for him. Don't you agree? Oh, yes. You're, you're right, O'Hara. Well, here we are. Oh, is that the grave you're going to bury old Luigi in? Yes. Well, there doesn't seem to be anybody around. Where are the men that lower the coffin into the grave and do the burying? There aren't any. You see, Luigi died penniless. I'm burying him out of my own pocket. I couldn't afford the men to do it. You mean that you and Paul are going to bury him by yourselves? That's right, O'Hara. Well, I'll give you a hand. But I... Oh, but that isn't necessary. My and I can manage a lot. Yes, the coffin is only a little cheap pine one, and old Luigi weighs very little. It, it's nothing at all to oh, Nonsense. If you two are paying for old Luigi's funeral out of your own pocket, the least I can do is give you a hand. Come on. But oh, here, uh, it'll take at least an hour to bury him, and, and uh, there's no sense in your wasting all that time. Yes, besides, it's getting dark fast, don't you think? I'll it? help you bury old Luigi. And then we can all go back to the city together. But, oh, Hara, your clothes. Just an old suit. A little dirt won't hurt it. Come on, let's get the coffin out and get started. Now, now let's ease it out of the heart, out to the ground. Uh, that's it. Say, you two forgot to lock the coffin. Yeah, that's better. Did you want to say something, Charlie? Uh, if you and Paul were mixed up in Tony's escape, it would mean ten years in the penitentiary. No. No, Harold, I didn't want to say anything. Okay. Paul, have you got the ropes you used to lower the coffin into the grave? Yes, sir. Here they are. All right. Let's get it over with. <laughs> Coffin down easily. That's it. Uh, old Luigi isn't as light as you might think. Where are the shovels, Paul? Here. Fine. You use one while I use the other. What? Charlie, you better take it easy. Well, Paul and I shovel the dirt in. No. No, don't do that. Let me out of this coffin. Let me out. Let me out. Oh, what's the matter, Charlie? You're as pale as a ghost. You look as though you're hearing voices. Well, O'Hara, don't. Don't you hear? I don't hear a thing. O'Hara, listen to me. I surrender to O'Hara. I'll confess. I'll confess to everything. The state trooper I murdered. Killing your brother, the little kid I ran over. Let me out, O'Hara. Let me out. O'Hara, you heard what he said. He confessed everything. I didn't hear a thing. And neither did you two. Do you understand? Yes, we. We understand of her. Do you, Charlie? Yes. I... 
I understand. Okay, Paul. And let's start shoveling the dirt in. No, don't. Don't worry about I can fix everything in the house. Too bad about poor Tony, wasn't it? It must be unpleasant to be buried alive. You know, I've often wondered how long it takes a person to suffocate in a coffin. You know, if some brave soul would have volunteered for an experiment, I could... Oh, you have to go now. Too bad. But perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. I'm always home. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. Silent herald of life and death, success or failure. The unseen force that measures man's destiny, reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes the eleventh hour. Upon the whim of a serving wench. More wine, girl. More wine. The tavern's regulars come first, sir. Not drunken strangers with amorous hands. Insulted by that by a slip of word. Another word. Just one. Will cost you your life, sir. What? Who the devil are you? Bo Standish at your service. I take it you are a stranger to the Tavern of Lost Souls. I am, and I shall make a point of not returning. Then we shall both be content. Kitty has one rule for the Tavern, a rule that you have already broken. Oh, what's that? That its clientele should drink like gentlemen. I am a gentleman, sir, by birth. But not by inclination. You guzzle your wine like a fat sow. I get sir. You dribble your wine over your lace like a blubbering child. Uh, God, and God. I should enjoy the privilege of running you through. Shall we meet at dawn? Okay. I am uh, no swordsman, sir. I then am... pistols, perhaps? Oh, his hands tremble, sir. They could never hold pistols back. <laughs> He's learned his lesson, Bo. You wish to leave, sir? Uh, uh, yes, yes. But first, your apology, my friend. Kitty owns the tavern of Lost Souls. She is no serving wench. No, oh, I don't want his apology. But apart- he wishes to crave your pardon, Kitty. Uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, exactly. I, I had no idea. Good uh, night, my friend. I do have to leave now. I, uh, an appointment. Most important. Uh, uh, most important. <laughs> Bo, if your sword would serve England as it serves me, why not? My dear Kitty, my sword serves one man. Bo Standish. It is to my advantage, too, that peace should prevail in the tavern. Good wine and peace go hand in hand. Your glass is empty now. And will remain so. I shall return before midnight, Kitty. I have one thing in common with our departed guest. An urgent appointment on the Dover Road. Oh, take care, Belle. Please take care. <laughs> Unless I take considerably more than that, I shall regard this as a most unprofitable night. <laughs> Oh, 
deuced uncomfortable night, Margaret. Cold, wet. Why the devil we couldn't stay the night of that tavern we passed, I can't imagine. Father, you gave Dickens orders that we were to press on to do. Oh, that was in London. I wasn't so damn cold then. We have the package on time, that's all. Why couldn't Eric get me from his regiment in the summer? Perhaps because Napoleon was being difficult. Difficult? Has there ever been anything else? Blessed Corsican upstart, that's all he is. Where's that any gumption? He'd have driven him out of Spain months ago. As we British were driven out of America, Father? Margaret, I'm tired of being reminded in the middle of every discussion that 20 years ago I was betrayed at Saratoga. My regiment could have fought on indefinitely. I know, Father. If it had been left to you, America would still be a British colony. Yeah, well, there's nothing to laugh about, girls. Total disgrace, disgrace. Another thing, I... Stand and deliver! What the devil? Uh, who are there? Stiggy, uh, who are there? Uh, who are there? Stiggy! Stiggy, what are we stop for? Well, who pays to stop a coach? Throw down that horse pistol, my friend, or I shall perforce shoot it out of your hand. Well, you best be on your way. This is the Earl of Tristan's coach. Then yes, I am indeed privileged. <laughs> Steady, lad. Steady, go. The pistol. I'm waiting. Thank you. My left. The highwayman. And me here like a fool without a pistol. Dickens! You're this! Miss Your Lordship, my compliments. And to you, Mark. Why? If you will descend, I am sure we can terminate our business speedily and allow you to continue your journey. I have no intention of leaving the coach. My little eyes, too cold. As you wish. If you will hand me your gold, Your Lordship. No, we'll have to kill me to get it. Father. Well, if you lay a hand on my daughter, I'll hunt you down. I'll have to leave the Bow Street runners myself. The prospect of such a chase excites my curiosity, but even highwaymen can appreciate beauty, ma'am. We are on our way to Dover to meet my brother, sir. A man who is risking his life in the service of his country, not in the pursuit of gold stolen from his betters. Ma'am, I had no idea. I have no desire to spoil the homecoming of such a hero. You may drive on, my friend. Well... You mean you're simply going to let us go? In the face of such beauty and such valor, what else should I do? Come, lass, we'll fly our trade elsewhere. <laughs> You'd be wise to make all speed to Dover and break the return journey of the Tavern of Lost Souls. The war, my friend! The war! Well, I'll be... Father? Well, I will anywhere. Man may be a scout, but he acts like a gentleman. Did you get a close look at him, Margaret? I did not wish to. He could have killed us if he'd wanted to. Absolutely helpless we were. Could do a thing to stop him if he had a mind to it. Amazing. Are we going to sit here all night, Dickens? You said I was dismissed, your lordship. Oh, not here, you fool. Oh, halfway to Dover. All right, I'll give you another chance. But next time, shoot and then whip up the awful. I'll get to Dover before I freeze the mess. Come in. Oh, Bo, you're not hurt. Only in my pocket, where it hurts most. The most unrewarding night to work, Kitty. Except for... Oh, but never mind. I think you would have visitors to stay the night, Kitty. Three of them. Four with the coachman. Well, what happened, Bo? I stopped a coach and made the acquaintance of the Earl of Twissenden. And he had no purse? I don't know. I let him go. You let him go? But why? Why take such risks for nothing? My dearest Kitty, the Earl has a most charming daughter. Haughty, delightful, and very beautiful. She has red hair, no doubt. It was dark. Uh, the night, I mean. Her hair gleamed in the half-light. Yes, it was red. And you told them to stay here? I did. Even this tavern cannot exist without custom. Oh, Bo. 
There's enough here for both of us. We could live well if you'd help me with the train. My dear, I should die of boredom within a week. You'll die kicking your heels for the merriment of the mob if you persist. <laughs> At Tyburn, no doubt, or perhaps they'll hang me from a gibbet on the Dover Road as a warning to cullies like me. I hope their coach makes good time on the return journey. Because of her? Hmm. <laughs> no, dear Kitty, because of my pocket. Mm. I have a feeling that the Earl of Twissenden will play at cards tonight. And my night's work will be worthwhile, after all. More wine, your lordship? Oh, thank you, I need it, sir. Um... Standish, you say your name is, huh? Yes, your lordship. Standish, Standish. Uh, I don't know the name, but I have a feeling we've met somewhere before, have we? I doubt it, your lordship. Mm. Well? Thank you, Kitty. I believe it's your turn to play, sir. What? Oh, yes. Mm. Oh, I don't seem to have anything worthwhile in this hand. Hope you've got something, Eric. Family honor has got to be retrieved somehow. Nothing, Father. Then I would say that the center is mine, gentlemen. I must say you're a wizard with the cards, Standish. Well, I'm off the fortune tonight. Wizards are full of tricks, are they not, Standish? The swiftness of the hand that deceives the eye. Eric, really? Does it not strike you as odd, Father, that ill luck with the card should follow us so painstakingly? Fighting the French seems to have loosened your son's tongue, your lordship. Or is it that His Majesty's forces have tasted defeat once too often? You're a cheat, Standish. A cheat and a liar. Kitty, where is Lord Twissenden's room? On the first floor, number 13. An unlucky number, your lordship. My second will call on you. You own a rapier, I presume? I do. Then we shall settle for swords. Oh, I just stand it. Look, the, the, the boy's over wrath here. Surely we can come to some arrangement. By all means, Lord Tristenden. I presume you will second your son. Um, yes, but I... I regret that you will be present at his death. Good night, your lordship. <laughs> Come in. Your ladyship. I am not here by choice, Mr. Standish. Then why? I have come to plead for my brother's life. Your ladyship. I, I... know who you are, Bo Standish. It was you who held us up at Pistol Point earlier tonight on the Dover Road. I have talked with Miss Kitty, and she tells me that you cannot kill him. You cannot. He has only to apologize before morning. Do you think he will do that? I rather hope so. I dislike rising at such an early hour. My father knows Eric was wrong. You did not cheat. There is always the possibility that your brother might kill me. I know everything about you. Your skill with a rapier. How many men have you killed, Bo Standish? The ones who use such words as cheat and liar. But if you were a gentleman... Oh, but I am not... I was born into the gutter, in Cheapside. My clothes are the finest that ill-gotten money can buy. My lace is imported from France. My sword was a gift from the great Sardini himself. My hose is imported from Spain. But even so, I am not a gentleman. You had a chance earlier tonight to rob me. Even kill me, if you had wished. You did not do so then. I beg you, do not do so now. Do not rob me of my brother. Your hair is even more beautiful than I thought. Miss Kitty has told me of your prowess with... with the rapier. Could you not defend yourself and... And let your brother live? Lady Margaret, I... I hesitate to dwell upon the consequent blot upon my reputation. But live he shall. Now it is long past your bedtime, Lady Margaret. Go to your room. I give you my word that this is one affair of honor I shall contrive to lose. <laughs> 
you gentlemen that dueling has been outlawed in England. His Majesty has... If you're to preside at this affair, then do so. I did not come here to talk. There are certain formalities that must I be... I have observed. no intention of retracting my accusation. In fact, Mr. President, I reiterate it. The gentleman I'm to fight is a cheat and a liar. Very you young fool. Father, I've made a number of inquiries about this gentleman since last night. He is, among other things, a common highwayman. Do you deny this standing? I dislike the word common. I regard myself as the most uncommon highwayman. By George, of course, you're the... I favorite. should like to examine your points, oh. gentlemen, please. Satisfactory. Thank you. You will remember that first blood decides the victor. Agreed? My adversary is going to spill rather a lot of blood, Mr. Preston. What a ghastly thought to entertain on such a lovely morning. Dr. Welbeck, will you come over here, please? Of course, Get it over quickly, Mr. President. I have an urgent case of shingles to attend. Yes. Uh, ready, gentlemen? Salute. En garde. Play. I thought the army favored the Italian school, Lord Eric. Have at you. Relax your wrist, Lord Eric. Gently. Your fingers should caress the hilt. I am not in the cell now, Standish. I... I intend to kill you. Ah! Enough. First blood to his lordship. Doctor, will you attend, Mr. Standish? Better scratch, Doctor. Let me see it. Roll up your sleeve. <laughs> the greatest duelist in England. As a bout, I find it very disappointing. Very good, boy. Our coach is waiting. I... A moment, Father. Uh, shall we meet again, Standish? I shall kill you. Do you understand? It's nothing serious, Mr. Standish. A little blood, that's all. Good morning, gentlemen. Oh, wait for me in the carriage, Eric. Standish, I should like to talk to you for a moment. We have nothing to discuss, Your Lordship. I, um, I saw you drop your point after sending his attack. Uh, it was almost as if you guided his sword into Gray's arm. I assure your lordship, you are wrong. I'm, and, uh, I'm deeply grateful to you, Standish. Uh, very fond of this son, the only heir. Deeply grateful. <laughs> Margaret, I'm worried about your brother. Deeply worried. He is rather more pompous than usual since the Beau Standish affair, I admit. But no doubt he'll get over it. Uh, well, where is he now? Where he spends every hour of the day, at the great Sardini's fencing school. He's decided that having established such a reputation as a duelist overnight, Father, he can teach even Sardini. Bah! Stupid young fool! He's paying for lessons from Sardini, but Eric contrives to make it sound as if the boot were on the other foot. I shall be infernally glad when the young idiot goes back to his regiment. Oh, I suppose I've spoiled him a great deal. Needed a mother's influence. Well, we both spoiled him, darling. Uh, Margaret, uh, do you know who Bo Sandish is? Yes, Father. Oh. I'll never understand why he let Eric defeat him. The first few moments of the duel, he made Eric look like a lumbering fool. Masterly, masterly. It was almost as if he wanted to lose the fight. Lose it without coming to any great harm. Huh? He parried that thrust of Eric beautifully and then dropped his sword point just far enough to allow the boy to nick his arm. Uh, Margaret, are you listening? Yes, Father. Well, well, well why the devil should you do that, huh? In one short night, Bo Standish holds us up at pistol point, refuses to take our gold, then contrives to save my son paying the penalty of his bad manners. I don't understand. No, I simply do not understand. I 
asked him to lose the duel. I see. You what? I went to his room after you and Eric had retired and begged him to allow Eric to defeat him. Do you realize what you've done, Gil? If anyone ever discovers the truth of the matter, I should be the laughing stock of London. Still, so I'm, um, I'm glad you did it. Oh, perhaps I can make young Eric see how deucedly lucky he was. Uh, there you are, Father. Margaret. Shall I ring for Martha? I think perhaps a glass of Madeira. I want to talk to you, Eric. Uh, please, Father, not now. I've had a most exhausting day. You know, Sardinia is quite good with the foil. Do you intend to spend your entire leave fencing? My leave? Oh, of course, I've got to tell you. I resign my commission. What? You did what? Resign my commission. And what, may I ask, do you intend to do with yourself? Perhaps the tables play the tables, and, well, you know, the usual thing. After all, I have some little reputation to enjoy now. <laughs> I find the glamour that surrounds the man who defeated Bo Standish quite pleasant. Much more so than the winter mud of Spain. Uh, I say, something wrong. You, you... <coughs> You've resigned your commission. And you think the greatest fencing master in Europe is quite good with the foil. You intend to gamble. Is there anything else you intend? Yes, Father. I intend to repair to my rooms and have Master bring me some Madeira. I may join you both for dinner. Come back here, you young fat fool! The strutting, conceited young popinjay. I'm afraid the time has come, Margaret, for Master Eric to be taught a lesson he'll never forget. This time, I shall visit Bo Standish. This time, I shall plead with him. I should like to make sure that my ears are not deceiving me. As I understand it, you wish me to challenge your son to a duel. Is that right, sir? Quite right, sir. You wish me to defeat him? I do. But he is not to be more than scratched, at most disarmed. Oh, um, correct. I see. May I ask why? Because ever since you fought him, he's been more arrogant than ever. Oh, I know perfectly well that you allowed him to defeat you, Sandish. I knew it at the time. And since then, Margaret has told me that she... Well, she told me. At the risk of offending you, sir, how is it that such a paragon should possess such an obnoxious brother? I don't know. Wish I did. Hmm. I don't want him hurt, though. Not not physically, Sandy. Exactly. Yeah. I understand. Is everything all right, though? Dearest Kitty, everything is well. We'll just come to the door and yell when you want some more wine. <coughs> may I ask you a question, Bo? Oh, I, I presume I may call you Bo. Of course. What is it? How did this tavern get its name, the Tavern of Lost Souls? I christened it. Really? When Mistress Kitty's parents died, they left her the tavern. Mm. I was passing one night on my way to a meeting, such as our first, really? and stopped for refreshment. The parlor was full of men in their cups, and amongst them stood Kitty with a flagon of wine held high above her head as she fought to disengage herself from the arms of a drunken sot. Stably. It was like a scene from the inferno, my lord. The firelight, the candles... And the tankard spilled on the tables. Well, then, isn't it time it was christened again? I think not. Mm. There's no more famous or quieter tavern now between here and the coast. Bo, will you do me this favor in regard to my son? On certain conditions, sir. Oh? First, that you and Lady Margaret attend the duel. Secondly, that Sardini himself shall preside. Sardini? Yes. I spent five years in Spain under the guidance of Sardini. I owe my skill with a sword to the maestro. It is fitting that he should be there. This time, I promise you will not escape so lightly, Standish. I'm glad to have this opportunity of demonstrating something that you seem to have found hard to believe, Sardini. Your gladness is no greater than my own, sir. You have met my opponent, I trust? We have met, yes. Your seconds are ready. Oh, I'm quite, quite ready, Maestro. Yes. And you, Senor Standish? Of course, Maestro. You will attend, Doctor. I am ready. Then, gentlemen, let us commence. Salute. On guard. 
Nick. There is no hurry. We have time to play. With that shirt made in Spain, sir? It was. I dislike the cut. Allow me to improve the styling. Why, you... <laughs> I'll kill you for that. I'll... With or without your sword, your lordship. Sheer luck. I lost my grip. Then pick up your sword and try again, sir. You will retire while he does so, Senor Slendish. Back three places, if you please. Of course, my sir. Your sword, little man. Thank you, father. On guard, Standish. Defend yourself. Your cravat is abominable, your lordship. Abominable! <laughs> At least you will now find it easier to breathe. It will not be long before you cannot breathe at all, Standish. <laughs> Blade should dance, my friend, like this and this. Your cuff's position is low, your lordship. You too low, your lordship, allowing me to thrust like so. Oh. Enough. Doctor, you will attend him. At once, maestro. My boy, are you all right? Uh, Eric, are you hurt? Get away from me. Get away. Leave me alone. Thank you, Standish. Hmm. I've no doubt that now he'll return to his regiment. And, um, that, uh, that purse you requested on the Dover Road is yours. Hmm. I shall send it to the tavern of Lost Souls. Thank you, sir. I'd better go and attend the boy. I think you'll need me now. Hmm. Bo? Bo, why did you want me here? To say goodbye. What else? Goodbye? But I thought... It really is the loveliest town. Don't joke with me now, please. Not now, Poe. Joke? That I would never do. Not with you. Goodbye, Lady Margaret. Are you coming, Margaret? But, Bo, I thought... I mean... A highwayman. I'm Margaret. <laughs> goodbye, both of you have remembered your lessons well, Senor Standish. Thank you, Master. I am glad that my belief in you was worthwhile. Yes, Senor. Very graceful for an Englishman. Quite remarkable. The severing of his cravat, the saber movement with which you cut his shirt, superb, and your defense, your parries. Quite good. But that final thrust... The lunge. That, Senor Standish, was disgusting. listening for another mounting drama when we again present The Eleventh Hour.
escape tonight to the China Seas in Typhoon. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations presents Escape, a new series of programs of which this, the fourth, is Typhoon by Joseph Conrad, produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Of all the great authors who wrote of the sea, none so captured the wonder and the horror of it as did Joseph Conrad. Tonight, we escape to the China Seas in his great story, Typhoon, told in the words of a certain Mr. Jukes, chief mate of the China coast steamer Nan Shan, a young man of very remarkable perceptions. I've been sailing the China Sea long enough to see some strange and terrible things, but nothing as bad as that was. Why, God himself forgot us, and the whole blinking universe set out to do us in that night. It was the... Oh, but that comes later. I guess you can't really understand what happened on board the Nan Shan without knowing something about our skipper, Captain McWhir. Stupid McWhir, I called him. And after sailing with him for three years, I ought to know what I'm talking about. Why, I tagged him right off, first day he came aboard to take command. In Liverpool it was, and Mr. Siggs, who was one of the owners, was showing him around the deck. There's no more modern ship afloat. I might say again that you've come to us very highly recommended, Captain McWhir. We've a great deal of confidence in you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Siggs. She's a brand new ship and a good ship. There's no reason why you shouldn't continue in command of her as long as you like. Hmm, well, that's, uh, that's fine. She'll be the smartest thing afloat in the China trade. Why, <laughs> she's put together like a Swiss watch. Precision built from stem to stern. Wait, the... uh, just a minute, Mr. Siggs. What is it? That lock. Uh, lock? Uh, what lock? Here, on the cabin door. Uh, what about it? You'll notice how it's been set in the frame, somewhat cocked at an angle. The ship starts rolling a bit, and the first thing you know, it snaps open and leaves the door swinging. It really should be fixed, Mr. Siggs. That's Captain McWhir, the best berth he'd ever had. New command, a brand new ship. But instead of pinching himself to see if he's awake, he complains about a lock on the cabin door. Oh, yes, see what I mean? Captain McWhir, I, I see what you mean. I'll have it attended to right away. I, I think you'll do all right. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Siggs. Well, everybody knows what the China coast is. You haul out of Bangkok for a quick run up to Singapore and then shove off for Hong Kong. Two days ashore, and you do it all over again. Three years of it. Three years of heat, smells, weather, copra, silk, and tea. Along in there somewhere, the owners decided to transfer the ship's registry to the Siamese flag. Don't ask me why. They just did, that's all. Anyway, I can tell you I didn't like it. When you grow up under the Union Jack, you figure to go on sailing under it. Not that the skipper, of course, could understand that kind of a feeling. Oh, no. Not old stupid McWhir. <clears throat> Aye? What is that, Mr. Jukes? They uh, just sent the new flag out from shore, sir. Here it is. Oh, fine, fine. Unroll it. Let's have a look. Ah, oh, yes. In my opinion, sir... It's a queer kind of flag for a man to sail under. Oh? And what's the matter with it? Well, it, uh... Just looks queer to me, that's all. Well, now, let's see. A white elephant on a red field. Oh, just a minute. I'll look it up in the book. Hmm. Yeah, here we are. Siam. White elephant on a field of bright red. Length exactly twice the breadth. So. Well, there's nothing wrong with this flag, Mr. Jukes. Oh, isn't there? Not a thing. I hardly thought there could be. After all, these people ought to know how to make their own flag. It stands to reason. Does it now? 
You must have it confused with some other flag, Mr. Jukes. Well, all I can say is... Of course, you'll have to take care the seamen don't hoist the elephant upside down. That is, before they're quite used to it. I... I presume it might be taken for a signal of distress. And in that case, uh, well, the way I see it, that elephant stands for something like the nature of a Union Jack in the British flag. Oh, you think so? Well, it's like a bloomin' Noah's Ark. That's what it is. Mr. Jukes. I'm sorry, sir. I can't see where the color of a flag could anywise affect the navigation of a ship. I... Uh... All right, sir, I'll instruct the hands. It'd certainly be a most distressful sight to see that elephant hoisted upside down. Well, that was Captain McWhirr. Couldn't get a thing through his head if you drew him a picture. And that's the skipper we had to sail under on the maddest, wildest trip that any coaster ever took. We were loading out in Singapore. Half the cargo had already come aboard. The sun was blazing and the smoke from our stacks hung over the decks like a blanket. The Nanshan's winches puffed away aft and the cargo chains creaked and clattered across the combings. I was in the waist supervising the loading when Mr. Rout, the chief engineer, came up. Hey there, Jukes. What's going on down there on the dock? Looks like a blooming army. Well, I don't know, Mr. Rout. Must be a mob of coolies on the move. Uh, here comes a captain. Could be some of his doing. Uh, Mr. Jukes. Aye, sir. You keep the fall between deck clear of cargo. There'll be 200 coolies coming aboard, and we'll plan to bunk them down there. Good Lord, where are they bound? Fu Chow. We'll have to put in there this trip. Yeah, but we're not fixed to handle passengers, sir. Oh, they'll bring supplies aboard with them. Every man's got a camphor wood chest, so you'll have to nail deck buttons down there to keep them from sliding. Yes, sir, I'll see to it. I've all been working on a plantation north somewhere. Two-year contract. They're dying to get home. It wouldn't have been quite right to turn them down. You may as well start them coming aboard, Mr. Jukes. All right, sir. Ollie number one, boy, all the same. Listen, you savvy, huh? Ollie fellow, catch him here, top side, catch him, step, step, bottom side, all the time, chop, chop. Single file now, one fellow, one time, all the time. What do you suppose they carry in those boxes? Oh, I suppose their personal belongings, Mr. Jukes. And, of course, their two years pay in silver dollars. Well, they're as vicious a looking bunch of murderers as I've ever seen. Murderers? Oh, come now, Mr. Jukes. One or two of them, maybe. But in the main, I'd say they're honest workmen. Have to be to stick out a two-year contract on one of these plantations. Just the same, sir. We'd better not take any chances. No, I checked the lading weights carefully, Mr. Jukes. We can carry them without any overloading at all. I mean that... All right, sir. I'd better go hide the silverware in the officer's mess. Hmm. He's a hard lad to understand sometimes. I could say I had a premonition right then, and I wouldn't be lying. Anyway, that's how it started. At the hottest time of the year, 200 half-civilized coolies aboard, a captain with no more imagination than you could stick in your ear, we steamed out from Singapore and laid a course for the port of Fu Chow. Jukes, I don't like it. I don't like it a bit. Well, what don't you like about it, Mr. Rowe? Well, the looks of things. Something ominous about it. Oh, there's a bit of a swell running all right. There's not a breath of wind. It's uncommonly hot, that's all. It gives a man the jumps. <laughs> You're as bad as the second mate. He's been groaning around like the voice of doom all day. Well, uh, Mr. I don't Jukes. know. Mr. Jukes! Oh, that's the old man. I'll see you later. Uh, keep your steam up, Mr. Rowe. Calling me, Captain? I was, Mr. Jukes. Uh, what was all the long conversation with Mr. Rout? Oh, I, why, nothing much, sir. I, I didn't see any harm in talking a bit. I'm not on watch, you know. Oh, no, no, nothing wrong with it, nothing at all. I just wondered what you could find to talk about. Well, uh, different things, I don't know. I've seen people on shore sit around a table and talk for two or three hours. I never could understand it. It's just conversation, that's all, about nothing in particular. Mm, seems pretty silly. Well, 
You've noticed the barometer, no doubt? Yes, sir, it's dropping. Falling fast. Quite low now. Take a look. I'll say it's dropping. Bad time of the year for that sort of thing. Very bad. Anything you want me to do, sir? Oh, no, no. Must be some uncommonly dirty weather knocking about somewhere. Hey, Mr. Jukes? Yes, sir. Well, uh, that's all. Just thought you ought to know about it, that's all. Uh, carry on, sir, carry on. <laughs> Heavy one, all right, mate. Uh, them coolies must be having a time of it down below. Lucky for them, the old girl rolls easier than any ship I've ever seen. Hey, you just wait. Oh, you think we may be in for it, huh? Oh, no. I don't think anything. You're not going to make a fool out of me that way, Mr. Jukes. I didn't say a word. What's the matter with you, second? Why shouldn't you say what you think if you're a mind of Oh, no, you don't catch me. Whoa, there's another one. That's pretty rough. Now, whatever is about, we're steaming right into it. Ha! <laughs> you just try telling the old man that. And why shouldn't I? Matter of fact, I think I'll ask him about this cross swell. It's getting worse all the time. No, I've known skippers to break some right good men for saying a whole lot less. Uh, Captain McQuarrie. Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Jukes. What is it? The swell is getting a good deal worse, sir. Yes, I noticed that in here. Anything wrong? Well, I, uh, I was thinking about the passengers. Huh? What passengers? Why, the coolies, sir. Then if you mean coolies, say coolies, Mr. Jukes. A man ought to say what he means. What about the coolies? She's rolling her decks full of water, sir. I thought you might want to put her head at the swell for a bit, until this goes down, of course. Hmm, so that's it, eh? Put her head at the swell, four points off the course. Well, it's just for a while, sir. A swell as high as this can't last long. That stands to reason. Mr. Jukes, take a look at the barometer. Good Lord. Yes, exactly. It's a dead calm outside, isn't it? There's not a breath of air stirring, sir. Only that cross swell. I've been reading in the book here about storms. It's a funny thing. If a man believed everything written down here, he'd spend half his life running to get behind the weather. If I was to go by what this fellow says, I'd alter my course and come booming into Fuchau from the north. Four days late, 300 extra miles in distance, and a pretty bill for coal on top of it. I tell you, Mr. Jukes... If I knew every word in here was gospel true, I couldn't bring myself to do that. No, sir, I guess not. And how's a man to know if the book is right? If you dodge around a spot of dirty weather, how do you ever find out it was there in the first place? Answer me that. No, Mr. Jukes, there's things that a man can't get from books. I've thought it all out this afternoon. We'll hold her steady as she goes. Whatever you say, sir, you're the captain. I guess I'd... Better write up the log. I'm going on watch. Good. I dare say we're heading into something a bit out of the ordinary. Call me at once if anything shows up in the night, Mr. Jukes. All right, sir. I'll see to it. And, uh, Mr. Jukes. Yes, sir. If you're going into the chart room, please close that blinking door. I can't stand here a door banging. Yes, sir. 8 p.m. Swell increasing. Ship laboring heavily and taking water on all decks. Still a dead calm and very hot. Batten down the coolies for the night. The barometer is still falling. All appearances indicate an approaching typhoon. Steady as she goes, that's all we can do. Aye, sir. I'll sure try to. Well, do the best you can. Aye, aye, sir. Mr. Dukes. Mr. Dukes. Aye, Captain, I'm coming. Stand by. Over here, Mr. Dukes. Starboard bridge rail. Right, sir. Coming over. Uh, Mr. Dukes, why didn't you call me? Oh, there was no warning, sir. It is all of a sudden about five minutes ago. Blasted right out of a dead calm. Mm, the book was right in some parts, anyhow. How's it go in the wheelhouse? Agnes, look out, sir. Hang on. Oh. Uh, what about Hackett? He's on the wheel. Second is putting up shutters. The window glass will go if she starts breaking any higher. Oh, she'll break higher, Mr. Jukes. Much higher. 
It's a happy thought. You haven't altered the course? No, sir. Heading straight at the wind. Good. Nothing else we can do, Mr. Jokes. Understand? Yes, sir. Some things a man can't find in books. Just keep her at it, that's all. Captain, our boats are starting to break away. That's all right. But the boats are two of them are gone now. It can't be helped, Mr. Jukes. Hammering through a mess like this, we're bound to leave something behind. Starts to reason. Hold hard. Ah. She's still rising, all right. That one broke over the wheelhouse. We're done for, for sure. What's that, Mr. Jukes? You say something? I said. Is there any chance at all, sir? Can she live through it? She may. We can hope so long, at least. She's a good ship. That's all a man can ask. What's that? Somebody yelling? It's below us on the fore deck, sir. Up here, starboard bridge. Man shouldn't be on that deck unless he has to. It's a bit dangerous. Captain McClure, are you there, sir? Over here. What's the trouble, bosun? In Chinese, sir. They're... Wait, hang on. Oh. Oh. The Chinese. What about them? The all fetched away, sir. One big lump. It's horrible. Yeah, now what do you mean, fetched away? Rolling around in a hole in one big lump. Screaming like blooming maniacs, sir. All adrift. Mr. Dukes? Yes, sir. I can't make head nor tail of this. I guess you'd better go below and see to it. Put things in order. Well, well, what shall I do, sir? I can't tell you up here. Find out what's wrong. Straighten it out. That's all. That's all? Take the bosun with you. I'm going to try for the wheelhouse. All right, sir. Come on, bosun. All right, sir. Just straighten it out. That's all. Uh, well, how's the wheel stand, Haggard? As uh, steady as she goes, sir. You realize, of course, we've hit a typhoon? Aye, sir. Sorry I can't give you relief. Can you manage a while longer? I'll hold it to the course, sir. As long as there's a ship beneath her. Yeah, that won't be long. Oh, anything wrong, second? Wrong! We're all as good as dead men, that's what's wrong. Oh, now, I wouldn't say that. She's still afloat. Ha! And we've got it lucky here on deck. Plenty of chance to see what's coming before it hits us. A man always feels better when he can see what's coming. But it's a different story down below there. Not having knowledge of what's going on. Not knowing if we're afloat or sinking. Now there's the lads that's got it tough. The ones down there in the engine room. Time now for the steam to drop. Here, ride that throttle, Field. Can't let her rip her shaft out when she breaks clear of those wells. Hello, Bridge. Hello, Bridge. Confound it, why don't they answer the speaking to them? Can't tell if they're dead or alive up there. Hello. Hello. Yes, Mr. Rout. Captain, how is it on deck? Bad enough. It depends mostly on you. Well, so far, so good. We're holding a full head of steam. Good. We'll need it. Don't let me drive her under, sir. Have to take a chance. Can't see 20 feet up here. Got to keep moving enough to steer. I understand, sir. Count on us. Getting smashed about a good deal, but doing fairly well. As long as the wheel has stand. Wait. Wait. Hold on. Hello. Hello. Is that the captain, Mr. Rudd? I've got to talk to him right away. Wait a minute, Jukes. Something's happened up there. Hello. Hello, Bridge. You still there, Mr. Rudd? Right. Anything wrong, sir? No, not now. The second mate's lost, though. Overboard? Oh, no. Lost his nerve. Awkward circumstance. Had to knock him out, too. Too bad. You hear that, Jukes? Yes, let me talk to him. Captain, Jukes here. The bosun and I just took a look at the tween deck. It's them bloomin' boxes, sir. They've all broke loose and smashed to bits. And the coolies are fighting like crazy men for them silver dollars that's rolling around. I think... We can't have fighting on board, Mr. Dukes. There are 200 of them, sir. They're all trying to kill each other. I can't have it, Mr. Dukes. Put a stop to it at once, do you hear? Put a stop to it? How? They're crazy mad. They'll kill anybody that came on that deck. Your second in command, Mr. Dukes. Use your authority. Make it clear to them. We 
we simply can't stop fighting. Make it clear to them? Oh, yes, sir. After that, you'd better gather up all the money. I can't have it lying about on the deck. Get the bosun to help you. Wait, here it comes. Gee, Hassapat! There's the one that does it. That, uh, that must have swept the deck from stem to stern. Hello! Hello, Captain McGuire. You all right up there? Everything's all right, Mr. Hart. All the boats and half the starboard rail carried away. Nothing serious. There's nothing to worry about, Mr. Hart. Carry on. Nothing to worry about. Carry on. <laughs> hey, you're all right, Captain. As you say, sir, carry on. Carry on? Hey, now, hey, now. Where are you going? Where are you going, eh? Where do you think I'm going, you loudmouthed old windbag? Out on that deck to get myself murdered. Ha ha! Ha ha! Nothing serious, Juked. Nothing to worry about. The whole blooming <laughs> world's falling apart, and I'm out picking up silver dollars. Captain's orders. Come on, Bolson. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss any old Jukes. Carry on, boy. Carry on! <laughs> No help for it. Our gallant skipper says to stop the fighting. Use our authority. All right, then. Quiet down. Come on, bosun. Aye, sir. Stow it there, you fools. Cut it out now. Do you hear me? Authority, huh? They're clean out of their heads. We got to drive them to the bulkhead. Back up, now. Hey, none of that. Stay to it, bosun. You got to show them what for. Nothing else to do. Back up there. Captain's orders, you know. Follow me, boss. I do, you, sir. No, me, I don't. I was just thinking, sir. Yeah, what about it? Back there, no fighting allowed. Skipper's orders. I was just thinking. No, oh, you don't. Thinking, what if me old lady could see me now? Ah, uh, she'd say, oh, you jolly sailor lad. Keep over there. Jam him up, boss, and into the bulkhead. Captain, where are you, Captain? Over here, Mr. Dukes. Uh, you got everything cleared up down below? Oh, oh yes, we we took care of everything, sir. I thought you would. The wind fell all at once, stopped cold. It's been like this for ten minutes now. If you uh, think it was an easy job to bring that mob under control... Uh, the coolies? Oh, I dare say it wasn't. Had to do what's fair by them, though. Uh, Mr. Dukes... That barometer in there stands at the lowest point I've ever seen a glass in my life. You mean there'll be more of it? The worst yet, according to the book. It'll break sudden now. Any minute. A puff or two of wind, and then it hits. She's taken a horrible beating, sir. She has indeed. And she's in for a worse one. We haven't much chance, have we, sir? She may come through it. She's a good ship. There's the first puff. Mm, It'll hit us hard when it comes. You left them pretty safe, did you? The coolies? We strung lifelines, gives them something to hold on to. Good. I'd like to give them all the chance we can, whatever happens. Oh, they'll be all right, sir. I broke out rifles, paraded the crew, put them to guarding only companionways, leading off the team deck. You armed the crew, Mr. Jukes? Oh, sure. We won't have any trouble with them now, sir. Mr. Jukes, please have those rifles returned to the magazines at once. What? There'll be work for every man aboard in a few minutes. I can't spare seamen to stand around and hold rifles when it isn't necessary. Isn't necessary? Don't you realize those savages will think we stole their money? But they'll tear us to bits if they ever get out of that deck. Oh, I think they'll understand we're dealing fair by them. Collect the rifles, Mr. Duke. Captain, it's suicide. The best thing we can do is turn the whole mess over to the authorities and Fu Chow. If we ever get there... Well, I don't know. I figure that when anything happens on shipboard, it's up to me to settle it on shipboard. Part of the duties of commanding a vessel, Mr. Jukes. I've no doubt uh, I'll be able to reach an understanding with these men later. Understanding? You ought to have seen him a while ago when me and the bosun was down there. Lost their heads a bit, I guess. No wonder at that when... Here she comes. Pick up those rifles, Mr. Jukes, and something else. Yes, Captain. If anything happens to me, you'll be in charge. Only advice, keep her facing it. Best way to get through, facing it. That's enough for any man. All right, Captain, I'll remember. But one thing more, Mr. Jukes. Yes, sir. Something that always helps at sea is to keep a cool head. Just keep a cool head. Oh, no, keep a cool head. 
stitch in time saves nine, a rolling stone. What in the name of heaven do you do with a man like that? There was a clear blue sky and bright sunshine the morning we steamed into Fu Chow Harbor. Mr. Rout was leaning on a hatch combing, smoking a pipe, and the bosun lounged on the foredeck, waiting to pick up a line from the wharf. And the captain? Well, he was engaged in a most unusual right. occupation. Keep moving. He was sitting at a table on the foredeck, handing out silver dollars to them blinking coolies, all divided up even, the same amount to each one. Craziest thing you ever heard of in your life. You see, the way the captain figured it, since those blighters had all worked for two years at the same rate of pay, then their savings ought to all be about equal. As you can see, of course, that wasn't necessarily true by any means. wasn't even legal. But you couldn't tell him anything. Well, not that. Uh, Mr. Jukes? Yes, sir. Coming, Captain. Well, Mr. Jukes, I've disposed of our little collection of silver dollars. Now, that's great. Only wait till those boys get ashore and file claims against us. Oh, no, they won't do that. As a matter of fact, they were quite pleased at having it arranged that way. Figured it might avoid a lot of arguments later. They, uh, they sent a spokesman to thank me. Well, I'll be... Mr. Jukes, you may as well give all the hands six hours leave before we start working the cargo. Whatever you say, Captain. Oh, yes, and uh, before the carpenter leaves, I wish you'd have him fix the lock on that port cabin door. What? That seems to have got broken somehow. Uh, during the storm, I suppose. I, I can't stand to hear the door banging, Mr. Jukes. Aye, sir. I, um... Uh... I don't suppose it matters that the ship is battered from stem to stern, half her topside carried away, and smashed till she looks like a bloomin' Tinson freighter. Mr. Jukes, I don't understand you. You don't understand me, sir? Do you understand that we've come through the worst typhoon on the China Seas in 20 years? We're the only ship that got through? It's true. I suppose we were a bit lucky. Lucky, sir? With 200 murdering cutthroats running loose aboard and the very heavens doing their worst? We had a job to do and we did it. That's all, Mr. Jukes. That's the important thing. Yes, sir, that's, uh, that's all. That's all, he says. A job to do, a bit lucky. What can you do with a man as thick as that? But then, as I started to turn away, Captain McWhirr said something else that surprised me. With emotion wrung from the very bottom of his soul, he, he uttered words I never thought I'd hear coming from so, so stupid a man. But I'm glad we brought her through, Mr. Jukes. Truly I am. She's a good ship, Mr. Jukes. A good ship. I should have hated to lose her. I... I should have hated to lose her. Typhoon by Joseph Conrad was adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield and produced and directed by William N. Robeson, with Frank Lovejoy as Jukes, Raymond Lawrence as Captain McQuirr, and Cy Kendall as Ralph the Engineer. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Fewer. Escape is presented by the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations each week at this time. Next week, we invite you to escape to Paris of 500 years ago in Robert Louis Stevenson's story of a fascinating adventure, The Sire de Maltois d'Or. And so, good night until next week at this time, when again it will be time to escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
We make no guarantees, however, how long it will remain fiction. Exploring tomorrow. Now here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, the editor of Astounding Science Fiction Magazine, John Campbell, Jr. The scene is a missile testing base somewhere in the continental United States. The time, half past two on a Tuesday afternoon, five, maybe ten years from now. A rather unusual missile is getting worked over. Blast off is ten minutes away, and the countdown is in its last stages. And a man is sitting inside this missile, waiting. The United States is about to make its first attempt to send a manned rocket to the moon. Nine minutes to blast off, Captain. Still feel loose and easy? Like a bird, Colonel. Waiting to be cut loose and sore. How do you feel? Me, Captain. I'm just sitting here in the observation tower. You're the one in the launching pad. And you're the one who has to face all the reporters after blast-off. Me, I'm glad I'll be up there alone. How much time left, Colonel? Six minutes, 20 seconds. Let's run through the schedule one last time. Okay. I sit in this cradle and I wait for the rockets to toss me up into space. I get 500 seconds of 4G acceleration. Then I sit around and look out the viewport for the next four days while the ship coasts in zero-G free fall. I'm roughly eight and a quarter minutes past four. On Sunday afternoon, the autopilot is going to turn the rocket engines on again, long enough to land me in the Oceanus Procellarum, which better be as dry as the Palomar boys say it is. I climb into my little Jim Dandy space suit, wander around the moon for a while, take some snapshots, pick up a couple of rocks as souvenirs. And 15 hours after landing, I get back into my ship and I come home. Did I leave anything out? Not a thing, Captain. Three minutes, ten seconds. Well, all I do is sit here and wait anyway. Computer down below in the belly of the ship does all the work. Me, Mike Wellman, first man on the moon. Maybe, anyway. What do you mean, maybe? The ship's been tested thoroughly. There's no possibility of... A blow-up? No, go ahead. Don't be afraid to say it. I wasn't talking about that. The odds are pretty good that this bird is going to get me there. Only thing I'm wondering about is whether someone else is going to get there ahead of me. I'd hate to find a big vodka party going on when I get there. 90 seconds. It's wearing your launching pad, Captain. We've got to break contact now. Good luck. The next time I hear from you, it's going to be from space. Sure, Colonel. I'll report as soon as I'm in free fall. Then radio messages every four hours. Uh, you won't forget about those baseball scores, will you? Scores. 30 seconds, Captain. And all America is rooting for you. And I'm rooting for the Dodgers. So long, Colonel. See you next week when I get back. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, mark. Base. How do I come in? We're in shop, Captain. I'm oh, glad to hear it. Okay, uh, ship's time, 1,452 hours. Blast off went fine from this end. I got through acceleration good enough. 4G's isn't much fun, but I don't mind it in eight-minute stretches. The ship's in free fall now, no gravity at all. And it's weird, all right. Even after all those hours in the training chamber, I still feel a little strange. Very quiet up here. Nice. Man really can think here. And the view is really something. Where do you see the photos? How about the psychological reaction? You don't feel cut off? Me? A guy whose idea of heaven is being along with some books? Colonel, I like it up here. The psych test said I was an introvert, didn't they? Well, not really. Just sort of solitary minded. Ah, same thing. Well, it's us um, solitary minded people who are going to be your spaceman, Colonel. We don't mind the loneliness. Listen, Colonel. How are the cosmic ray readings coming through? Perfect. All the equipment seems to be functioning. 
Uh, including the pilot. Or rather, the live cargo, because that's all I really am. Okay, Colonel, I got a few odd jobs to do on board. And I'll be talking to you again in four hours. Over. <laughs> Here I am again, Colonel. Two days out, still no sweat. I'm getting used to this no-gravity business, and I... Go uh... on to the vessel's report, Captain. There's been a change in the operational plan. Huh? What kind of change? You want landing on the moon. Pentagon orders are for you to adjust the computer to alternate course B. Circle the moon and return to Earth without landing. Hey, wait a minute, sir. How come the switch? Well, it's, it's an awkward situation, Captain. You see, between the time I last spoke to you and now... The Russians, I know this will come as kind of a shock to you. The Russians made a successful landing on the moon. No! Radio Moscow announced it two hours ago. And since then, we've picked up broadcasts from the Russian ship. They've landed, all right. They beat us to it. By two stinking days, two days earlier, and I would have been the first. You haven't heard the worst part of it yet. The Russians have claimed the moon. They what? Like Columbus claiming the Western Hemisphere. We're putting up a yell, of course, but there just isn't any precedent for this kind of thing. The U.N. is meeting to decide whether they have any right to. So this is why I can't land, huh? The Russians say they'll regard any lunar landing as trespassing on their property. We can't risk an incident, of course. So for the time being, we're going to hold back and wait till the legal aspect of this business is worked out. So I can't land. They send me up here and I ride around for a week and don't even put my foot down on the moon. Ah, uh-uh, Colonel. Russia doesn't own the moon, no matter what they say. Captain Roman. I'm sorry, Colonel. I'm more than halfway there, and I'm darn if I'm going to miss my chance. I'm going to land, sir. Roman, listen to me. You can't disobey orders. Yes, I can, sir. I'm landing. Over and out. It's not that the moon wasn't meant for man. It's just that man was never designed for the moon. It's a fantastically inhospitable place. Harsh, blinding sunlight with no atmosphere to dim it. Jagged shadows. The rocks are hard, sharp-edged. There has been no weathering to soften them, and the shadows are just as hard and black. It's not a nice place to be alone. Or even when there's only one other human being within 200,000 miles. I don't know if you want to hear from me again, Colonel, but I'm beaming this anyway. Look, I just wanted to let you know that I've landed on the moon as originally scheduled. Yeah, right on the nose. In the designated landing area. Northern branch of the Oceanus Procellarum. And you can tell the Palomar fellas that they were right all along. Maybe this was an ocean once, but not in the last million years or so. As for the uh, Russian ship, it isn't any hoax. I saw it when I came down. It's about uh, 50 miles north of here. Maybe later I'll break out the rocket sled and wander over there for some vodka. Uh, the Russians are trying to contact me now. I better shift channel see what they want. Over, Colonel. Come on in, Ivan. Da, yes, Tavarich, Nishivo. I'm afraid that uses up my Russian vocabulary, Ivan. How's your English? I am Captain Dmitry Novikov, Solid Space Forces. You are illegally trespassing on our property, American. I am, huh? Say, your English is pretty good, but your politics isn't. You say the moon is yours, huh? Lunar, Soviet Socialist Republic? I'm sorry to disagree. Just getting here first doesn't give you the right to claim the whole place, you know. The matter has been considered by our legal experts. We have established prior claims. I am under orders to request you to leave Russian territory immediately. But this is cockeyed, claiming the whole moon. Now, look here, Dmitri. Let you me... will address me as Captain Novikov. Okay. Now, look here, Novikov. The moon's a big place, and there's room for a lot of us up here. It really isn't fair to want to hog the whole thing yourself. The Platinum said Soviet policy, not space pilots. I am instructed to warn you that you are trespassing. I do not wish to debate the matter, will you? So I'm trespassing, then. What are you going to do about it? My ship is armed. And you can't figure out any better way of celebrating the conquest of space and starting a war about it? The United States ordered you not to make a landing. They recognize our claim. We cannot tolerate violation of our rights. 
And you're going to be nasty about it, I see, huh? Well, I'll take my chances. Now I've got some work to do before I go back. I'll be leaving the moon in 14 hours and a bit. Hey, uh, now how long are you staying up here? You've been here better than two days already. You planning to hold the fort forever? My plans for departure should not concern you. Well, I'm just curious, that's all. Okay, Dimitri. Maybe I'll be talking to you again soon. And yeah, you, uh, sneaky son of a gun, congratulations. You did get here first. Over. Come in, launching base. You hear me? We're getting you, woman. We read you. Look, I, I just had a little chat with the Ruski. There seems to be only one of them. He gave me some malarkey about firing on me if I don't clear off the moon right away. Woman, you insubordinate idiot. You're liable to touch off a war over this moon trip. Well, what was I supposed to do? Smile politely and turn back just because they got here first? Do you think they have any right to claim the moon? Of course not. But that's not the point. You were ordered not to risk trouble by landing. Yeah, and I landed anyway. Well, go ahead. Chop my head off when I get back to Earth. Meanwhile, I'm here, and if that Russian doesn't blow me up, I expect to do a little exploring in the next 14 hours. I don't think the Russian is going to blow you up. He's got his own troubles. What do you mean? Well, we have decoded some of the messages he's been sending back to Moscow. Seems he made a faulty landing and has to make some repairs on his ship. It may take him a week or two, and he doesn't have enough food. Russia may be crowing about claiming the moon, but it's going to look bad for them if their spaceman can't get back and start the day. Yeah. Yeah, that would be rough. Uh, maybe I'd better call him back and see if I can help him out. Well, then leave him alone. He's a Russian. He's a human being. And so am I. Get off the wire let me call him, Colonel. I order you not to make any overtures to that Russian. Look, I'm not on Earth now. There doesn't need to be a Cold War up here, too, Colonel. And I have plenty of food to spare. Give the folks back home my love. I'm going to call Ivan again. <laughs> One thing to make a claim to say, uh, uh, this is mine. It's something else to hold on to it and make the claim stick. Somewhat like the colonel. Uh, it was a little difficult for him to enforce the orders he was trying to give to the man on the moon. Now the cops. You getting me? You have 20 hours to leave Russian territory. Then I must command action. Now look, don't give me that stuff. I know your ship's disabled and you're in trouble. This is untrue. My ship is in good condition. Dan Trotsky was Rasputin's brother. You know, Novikov, I sometimes feel I'm the only sane man in a world of lunatics. Those idiots down there in Washington didn't want me to land because it might make Moscow sore. And you don't want any help from me because I'm not a good Marxist. It's a losing battle, Dimitri. Everyone seems to know what he really wants, and yet everybody tries hard to get the opposite. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. You just sit tight. I'm going to launch the rocket sled and get over your way with a couple of cartons of provisions. If you won't take food from a lackey of Wall Street, that's your business. I'm coming over anyway. Novikov. My name's Mike Wellman. Why have you done this? What trick are you playing? Listen, friend, all I'm doing is bringing you some of my spare food. Nothing up my sleeve at all. I do not understand that. Up my sleeve? It's a decadent capitalist idiom. It means I'm not trying to fool you. The supplies are out on the rocket sled. Get into your suit and let's bag a minute. I said I would fire on you. And you bring me food? Eh, silly, isn't it? But they told me they picked up your messages to Moscow. That you were going to be stuck here a few weeks for repairs. I was not telling the truth. Hmm? This ship will never take off again. The rear rocket tubes are hopelessly crumpled. The fuel field lines are severed. It was a very poor landing. I gave incorrect data to the computers. And you told them you could fix it? They do not like to receive news of failure. Leave me alone, American. Take your food and go away. Hey, what are you going to eat? Rocks? There won't be a rescue ship up here for a month, at least. There will be no rescue ship for me. I do not deserve rescue. 
You just sit up here and starve to death? I'm at the faulty landing. I cannot return to my country now. And I disobeyed orders. I wasn't supposed to land because the moon is red property now. But the only Russian here is stranded, helpless. Do not mock me. I'm not. That's a fine bunch of spacemen you and me are. You smash up your ship and I disobey half my orders. But I'm glad I disobeyed anyway. At least there'll be one practical result of my trip. I'll be saving a man's life. You? Sure. You're coming back with me to Earth. We can jettison some of the meters and stuff and make room for you. I bet you don't weigh more than 150. We can manage. Sure. But save the butts for later. And if you're trying to argue me out of it, I'll slug you. Hello, Colonel. I'm on my way home. Pretty fair blast off, and we're 20,000 miles out in the moon now. Oh, I left a little of the equipment behind. The next ship can pick it up. And I've got a passenger. You mean that Russian? Yeah. Seems his ship was wrecked, so I talked him into coming back with me. He's down back in the galley fixing lunch now. I guess we'll both be called traitors for saying it, but uh, we've sort of become friends. And he doesn't think Russia ought to claim the moon either. Well, we have one distinction anyway. Maybe a Russian ship was the first to get to the moon, but it was the American one that made the first successful round trip. I like to think of it in a different way. Not an American ship or a Russian ship. Stuff like that shouldn't matter anymore. Call it a ship from Earth. Yeah. Novikov and I started out separately, but we're coming back together. The first expedition from Earth to Moon is coming on. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot. to introduce the play, music to set the mood, music as a prelude to words. Original composition for five after the hour by Frank Smith. Interpretation by the orchestra under the direction of Cesar Petrello. And now, sweep the theme to conclusion and prepare for the play.
five after the hour brings you a love story, pure and simple. Principal ingredients for a love story, a place like Brooklyn at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning, a girl named Millie, and a boy named Joe. Also, various lines from assorted poems. That's about all you have to know about this story, called Make Out with a Poem. Look, Millie, I'm asking you again like I've been asking you for the past three years. Are you or you're not going to marry me? Really, Joe, that is no way to propose to a lady. Are you or aren't you going to marry me? You might as well be saying, are you or aren't you going to tell me the time of day? As romantical as saying, shoot the sherbet to me, Herbert. The effect's all the same. I never called you Herbert. Gosh, Millie. The trouble with you, Joe, is you do not know how to be romantic. Romantic? That's a laugh. After all the time we've been going together, I ought to call you sis. You gotta have poetry in your soul to be romantic. Our whole life is a poem, Joe. Did you know that? What kind of talk is that? Life is a poem. Honestly, Millie, sometime I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about poetry, Joe. Rhymes and beautiful thoughts and beautiful words. Well, if it's rhymes you want, I can recite you every one of them like the shave signs between here and Jersey City. Or I can recite, there was a young lady from Yonkers. Yo, I don't mean that kind of poetry. I mean, uh, uh, poetry. Huh? Real poetry. The kind of words that... Make you feel you got clouds under your feet. The kind of words that make you hear music when when there isn't any music playing. You feeling okay, Millie? Honestly, Joe, you got the soul of a a garage mechanic. But Millie, I am a garage mechanic. Well, you don't have to think like one, do you? You don't have to talk like one, do you? Anyone can talk poetic like if they only put their mind to it. Yeah. I can just hear the guys down at the garage if I begin spouting poetry. I'd never live it down. Joe, you wouldn't be doing it for the boys down at the garage. You'd be doing it just for me. Doing it? Doing what? What are you talking about? Uh, Listen, Joe, I read about it in the paper just the other day. It's over in Manhattan. They call it a school for poets. And for ten dollars, they absolutely guarantee to have you talking poetry in two weeks. Oh, please, Joe, go on over and let them teach you to talk like a Shelley, a Wordsworth, or a Keats or something. That's part of their ad. You can have your choice as to which poet you want to talk like. Millie, are you nuts? Quite to the contrary, Joe. I am very serious. Well, it's out. All the way out. I should go to school to learn to talk like a longer. <laughs> no, thanks. Then. I am afraid I cannot marry you, Mr. Mahoney. Oh, Millie, come off it, will you? Good night. Okay. okay, what's the address of the jurnt? Joe, Joe, do you mean it? You're going to do it? Yeah, I'm going to do it. But I know I'm going to hate myself in the morning. Excuse me. You are excused, sir. That much is true. Now, what can we poets do for you? Uh, a certain party wants I should sound like a poet. I see. What sort of poetry did you have in mind? The ballad, the sonnet, or the epic kind? I don't know. What you got on the menu? Well, our curriculum covers, the catalog states, the poetical field from Arnold to Yeats. With Homer and Virgil, Cervantes and Burns, Schiller and Gaeta, you'll learn them by turns. Milton and Wordsworth, Dryden and Dunn, and the sonnets of Shakespeare we take one by one. Never heard of the bums. What's their batting averages? Hmm. Then there's Shelley and Byron, Browning and Gray, Whitman, Rossetti and Stephen Benet, Bryant, Sandberg, Jeffers, Thoreau, McLeish, Millet and E.A. Poe. And we also teach upon request the philosophical writings of Edgar Guest. 
If this isn't enough from which to draw, we'll throw in Falstaff Openshaw. He kills me. But, uh... Millie says I should go high class. Now choose from this list, and before you know it, we'll have you speaking like a poet. Okay, it's a deal, and I'm taking the works. The whole works. I guess I'll show Millie talk like a poet, she says. Okay. So I'll talk like the whole book of poets. When do we begin, mister? If it's the entire course you're looking for, we'll start at once. Right through this door. Uh, hey, if you don't mind... uh, I'd like to get exposed to some of that romantical stuff right away. Certainly. The romance department and Miss Willoughby make a very fine pair, as you shall see. Oh, the registrar. Did you call? I'm here and ready to give my all. Oh, what am I saying? That is the head of the romantical department. I assume you wish to learn words of romance. All right, this will be your first chance. Rhyme the word love. Rhyme love. With uh, what, for instance? Well, dove. Love, dove. Yeah, I get it. Uh, but uh, what's it mean? No, a rhyme toil. Oh, sure, that's easy. Goyle. Pardon? Goyle. Goyle! A female lassie, Goyle. Goyle. Mm-hmm. Ooh. <laughs> Your pronunciation is most amusing. Your speech pattern, shall we say, confusing? Yes, let's say that. Confusing. confusing. <laughs> but uh, put your mind at ease. Through our course, you'll breeze. We'll make of you a splendid bard. But, but you, you must, must work, work very, very, very hard. hard. Once more, please, Mr. Mahoney. Oh, my love is like a red, red rose. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee. Love is the blossom where there blows everything that lives or grows. He that loves a rosy cheek or a coral lip admires or from star-like eyes doth seek fuel to maintain his fires. (laughs) The past two weeks have been well spent. You've gone to good from worse. I mean worse. Your graduation present is this anthology of verse. Motor's missing, buddy. You give it a look, see? If the motor's missing, look around or maybe try the lost and found. Oh, wise guy, huh? Look, buddy, I'm in a hurry, so do not give out any games. Okay, my command is your desires. Kindly expose your ignition wires. Hey, do you always talk like that? No, just in my waking hours, I suppose. My dreams is all the purest prose. <clears throat> look at that engine. You gotta agree, it's a mess of wrecking out of thing. Huh? The carburetor's full of carbon, the gas is full of dirt, and there ain't a drop of oil, not one blessed little squirt. Hey, look. Your ball bearings look like buckshot. The differential's out of whack. You better get those spark plugs ground, or else they're gonna crack. No. The wheels need realigning. The muffler does not muff. My advice is to you to get a horse and junk this hunk of stuff. Listen, buddy, I ain't asking for advice. I'm telling you to fix her up, and in a hurry. I ain't got all day. It is true we aim to please the folks, but we cannot fix practical jokes. All I want is a little service. And what do I get? Insults. Nothing but insults. Where's the owner of this here garage? I do not have to be insulted. And in poetry yet. Joe, come on in. Millie, I... Uh... Joe, how many times do I have to tell you that my name ain't Millie? It's Millicent. 
Millicent Rose, to be exact. Okay, Millicent Rose. But listen, Millie. What are you doing here in the middle of the morning? Why aren't you at the garage? I'm trying to tell you, Millie. Joe. Joe, you didn't get fired, did you? No. Oh, that's good. I was afraid for a minute you might have had a fight with... You quit? Yeah. Yeah? Is that all you can say? Yeah? What did you go and do that for? Millie, you wanted I should talk like a poet, so I did what you desired. But because poems and garages don't mix at all, I quit before I got fired. Listen, Joe, don't blame me because you sound so ridiculous when you open your mouth. I did not want for you to talk like a poet all the time. Just when you was proposing to me. Okay, Millie, so I'm proposing, and naturally I'm supposing that because I'm rhyming a beautiful thought, you'll marry me pronto, like you should ought. Joe, you have still got the soul of a garage mechanic. Coming up here in broad daylight, in a pair of greasy overalls, standing there with your hands in your pockets, asking me to be your wife. I give up, Joe. I really give oh, up. Oh, Millie, For the honey. last time, there has got to be a moon, Joe. And music. And shadows on the bridge. And wind making the water ripple. That's poetry. Okay, Millie, I'll pick you up tonight at eight. We'll try it again no, and make... No, Joe, I cannot marry you as long as you have not got a job. What would we live on? We cannot eat poetry. But Millie... The name is still Millicent, and the subject is closed. I will not marry you until you can support me in the style to which a lady should easily get accustomed. But Millie... Good day, Mr. Mahoney. <laughs> Mr. Mahoney, glad you've come back. You won't be in a minute, you poetical quack. What's that? I wanted to learn some romantic words, but this perpetual dry rhyming is strictly nerds. I'm out of a job and I ain't got a girl. And when I finish with you, your long hair's gonna curl. Please, now keep your distance, Mr. Mahoney. Blaming me is pure baloney. Maybe this'll change your tune. It's guaranteed to make you swoon. No, sir. Slugging me is not quite cricket. In fact, I find it downright wicked. But you've won a prize. I cannot withhold $100 of the nation's gold plus a position fit for the bards composing rhymes on greeting cards. You mean roses are red, violets are blue? That's it, exactly. Good luck, and a two. Mr. Mahoney, we need a poem for our new shipment of Mother's Day cards. Right, Miss Fidget. Take a rhyme. Ready, Mr. Mahoney? Uh, when I come home at eventide, the first thing that I see is my charming gray-haired mother just waiting there for me. Got that? Mm -hmm. Sweet. She cooks my meals. She mends my socks. She regulates my life. And mother is the reason why I haven't got a wife. Look at this nice card I've got from my son. Oh, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Charming, gray-haired mother. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And mother is the reason why I haven't got a wife. Isn't that a lovely thought? Johnny's such a sweet boy, matron. Sometimes I wish I hadn't poisoned his wife. Mr. Mahoney, Barton's real estate agency would like a poem about homes. We have none Sit down, Barton. Miss Fidget. Uh, what are we waiting for? Why, Mr. Mahoney... Take a poem, Miss Fidget. To know the joys of living, to know the love of friends, to know just what a home can mean when the turn in the day's road ends, to know that your kids are happy. That's what a home is made for. 
But not can compare with the feeling you get when you know that the joint is paid for. Um, show me, old boy. Listen to this card I bought for Sandra. Right, old Thurston. I've never liked babies. But you see, my baby is as pretty as she can be. With eyes of blue and dimples, too. With hair of burnished gold. She's honest and fair. And I love her true. My baby, who's 20 years old. Oh, <laughs> very good, Thurston. Uh, Chumley, there's a diamond bracelet that goes with it. But don't you dare tell my wife. Mr. Mahoney, you're a very clever man. Your greeting card poems are sweeping the country. But, uh, Mr. Mahoney, you're wasting your time. The place for you, sir, is in advertising. And uh, that's why I'm here today. My company is prepared to offer you. Ladies, do your hands suffer from? Are they, well, that way? When he reaches for your pretty paw, does he draw away? Hmm? When you look at your hands, do you go? Yes! Ladies, you've made a horrible error if you've got hands that are a terror. But still, your paws can be a dream if you slosh them around in Cree, me, Cree! Ladies and gentlemen, the jingle you have just heard was the original composition of Joe Mahoney, noted writer. For another original composition by Mr. Mahoney, stay tuned to the station for exactly 30 seconds. Gentlemen of the Congress, the solution is clear. Conscript Joe Mahoney, a man of cheer, employ his talents, use his brain. He's our man. He'll cure the pain of world disorder, war, and strife. He'll make all nations man and wife. Well, Millicent Rose, will you be my wife to have and to hold the rest of my life? Yo. You have to propose that way. I've told you, darling, time after time, you started me out on a life of rhyme. Poetry, poetry, always poetry. But look, my sweet, I've gone to the top by making rhymes, and now I can't stop. Think, just think what our life will be. With just you and me, and little he. I can see him now toddling down the walk, rhyming rhymes and baby talk. Daddy? Hello, Junior. What's on your mind? Have you lost a plaything you can't find? Confide in your father. Tell him all. Tell him everything, big and small. Her fathers are friends and counselors, too. Come on, Junior. What's eating you? Daddy, father, counselor, and friend. This is the beginning, not the end. Daddy, please come play with me. I'm just as lonely as I can be. When I'm alone, it's not any fun. I wish I was two instead of just one. No, no, I can't stand now, it. Now, Mother, cease your cry of woe. We implore you, Joe and Joe. Be romantic. Make with a poem. Why? Take joy in this our happy poem. Join us in our life of rhyme. For fun and joy and great good time. Be happy, carefree, think up a verse. Come take me, darling, for better or worse. March down the aisle, carrying blossoms of orange. While I'll... While I'll... While I'll... Orange. Borange. Gorange. 
Zorin. For him. Zorin. Millie. It's gone. Millie. I've lost it. Oh. Oh, Jill. Make Out with a Poem was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrath, with lyrical assistance from Carol Lederer. The music was the original composition of Frank Smith, and the orchestra was under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Make Out with a Poem starred Elmira Ressler as Millie and Anna Wainwright as Joe. Supporting players were Constance Crowder, Charles Irving, Sherman Marks, Janet Niles, Tom Moore, and Norma Jean Ross. Poetical acknowledgments with thanks to Burns, Shelley, Wordsworth, Keats, Browning, oh, uh, and of course, Joe Mahoney. Attention, young women of America. The United States Cadet Nurse Corps offers you your opportunity. Military requirements in the all-out against Japan have created an acute shortage of nurses on the home front. If we are to have enough nurses to maintain civilian nursing services and to meet the further needs of the armed forces, the U.S. Public Health Service must enroll 60,000 new student nurses in the Cadet Nurse Corps. If you are between 17 and 35 years of age a high school graduate with a good scholastic record and in good health. This is addressed to you. All expense scholarships are now available to qualified young women. Apply to your local hospital or write to U.S. Public Health Service, Box 88, New York 8, New York, for full information. Do a woman's work in the fight for victory. Join the Cadet Nurse Corps. <laughs> Live After the Hour originated in the studios of WBBM Chicago and will be heard next week at the same time. Ken Nordine speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio